Hi, welcome to our heat pump workshop. This is targeted to cities and towns in Massachusetts to help them learn about potential applications for heat pumps in their schools and municipal facilities. But we'll also spend quite a bit of time on an overview of heat pump technology and equipment. So it should be useful for anybody who's interested in learning more about heat pumps. I'm Lauren Madison. I work for UMass Amherst in the Center for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy in UMass Clean Energy Extension. Before getting started, I'd like to give a brief overview of some of the services we offer. We do a limited number of free in-depth audits for municipal buildings, including schools, water and wastewater treatment facilities and pumping stations, and manufacturing facilities. We have created a report called Municipal Energy Profile, which we can generate for interested communities. It provides an overview of municipal energy use and priorities to help work toward energy reduction goals. And our website has a lot of information that could be useful in understanding and reducing municipal energy use and moving toward renewable energy. That includes an energy efficiency checklist that we've created for municipal buildings, a page on energy efficiency resources for municipalities, a page on solar resources for municipalities, and a page on greening municipal fleets. We also work with DOER to provide support for Mass Energy Insight. You can learn more about any of this and find out if you're eligible for our services by checking our website or writing to me, Lauren M at umass.edu. Now let's get into heat pumps. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Greg Hasselbarth is the Director of Commercial Business for the Northeast Region at Mitsubishi Electric Cooling and Heating. And J.S. Rancourt is a principal at DXS New England, Daikin's local manufacturer's representative. Just wanna thank everyone for coming. Um, I guess we can give a quick intro of each of us. Uh, my name is Greg Halsabarth. I've been with Mitsubishi Electric for coming up on 10 years now in a variety of different roles, uh, supporting the VRF and mini split market. Everything from engineering support, sales, um, to running the business, which I'm involved in now. Um, so I will kick it over to JS and I look forward to joining in and talking with everyone in a couple slides. Okay, thank you, Greg. And Thank you, Lauren. Again, my name is JS. Uh, we handle the Daikin uh, air source heat pump and VRF product line in the region. Uh, Greg has me by a couple years. Uh, this is my eighth year uh, using and working with the technology in similar roles to what Greg uh, is doing over at Mitsubishi. I'm from Canada originally, so I spent four or five years up in Toronto and Ottawa regions in Canada uh, working on VRF and air source heat pumps uh, and obviously uh, uh, cold weather over there as well. And I've been in the New England area for coming up on four years now. So we have two sessions. Today will be an introduction to heat pumps. We will take it back to the 10,000 foot level and explain a little bit the refrigeration cycle. If you are already familiar with that, we apologize. We wanted to take it right from the top and then dig more into different heat pump options. So I'll be doing the first part of today's presentation. Greg will be doing the second part, and we're going to leave some time for some Q&A. As Lauren mentioned, there is a Q&A function here, so feel free to ask them along the way. As I'm speaking, Greg will jump in and answer some in writing, and vice versa when he's speaking. Then tomorrow's presentation, Greg and I will speak for a little bit, and then we, have a, uh, we will have a presentation from the town of Lexington. So for today, this is a bit of the agenda. Uh, and uh, I will handle the first part and Greg will handle the second part. So like I said, I'll take it back to 10,000 feet. If you're somebody who's very visual, a very simple YouTube search for how the refrigerant cycle works or how heat pumps work, has all sorts of good short hits. Uh, and essentially we use the refrigerant cycle in almost all HVAC applications. The main purpose of it is to move heat from somewhere to somewhere hotter which is usually a challenge. Picture your coffee cup, your hot, warm coffee cup on your table and your house, it's going to cool down. It's sitting at 110 degrees, the ambient is 70 degrees. Naturally, the heat is gonna move from the coffee cup to the ambient until your coffee cup is the same temperature as your house. Now, if we wanted to go the other way around and heat it up, we can do a couple things. We can put it in the microwave, but we're not gonna use microwaves in HVAC. So we could also use electric resistance heating for it, but it's not very efficient. And with the price of electricity, that would cost a lot of money. 
So what we tend to do, and what we do in most buildings, is we burn things. We burn fossil fuels, whether it's natural gas or propane or even oil. Um, and because those are still relatively cheap, uh, even though it's not a very efficient way of doing it, that's still how we do a lot of things. So we could warm up our coffee cup by burning things and, and generating heat that way. But we could also use the refrigeration cycle and move heat from the ambient in that house into that, that coffee cup. So picture your refrigerator in your own house. Your refrigerator, in theory, is a heat pump. It has a refrigeration cycle. What your refrigerator does is inside of it, it's trying to maintain, let's say, around 40 degrees. And as soon as it gets a little too warm, 41, 42, the compressor kicks on, the refrigeration cycle kicks on, and it's going to move that heat from the 41 degree area to your house, which is at around 70 degrees. So it's moving heat from somewhere to somewhere hotter, which is your house. Uh, so essentially a fridge is a heat pump because there's two ways of looking at it. You can think of your fridge as a machine that cools a box, that cools itself down to 40 degrees using the ambient house at 70. But you could also think of your fridge as a heat pump. Your fridge heats your house using a box that it extracts heat from, which is the inside of the fridge. If you were to rip your front doors off of your refrigerator, open up your balcony doors and point it outside, you just made yourself a custom homemade air source heat pump because that fridge is constantly going to try and cool the outside and on the back of it where it rejects the heat, that's going to heat your house. So in theory, your fridge is a heat pump. It just depends on which way you're looking at it. And that applies for almost any type of refrigeration cycle. Think about your car. It has an air conditioner in there. That is a refrigeration cycle. The compressor uses the energy from the car engine to rotate, but that moves heat from the inside of your car to the outside, even on a, on a 95 uh, degree day. Uh, in theory, in the winter, we could heat our cars using the air conditioner, tweak it a little bit, and we can use it to generate heat. However, because we have so much excess heat from the engine that we already cool, we just heat our cars that way. But your car air conditioner, in theory, could be a heat pump. And then your room air conditioner uh, could be in your hotel, those window shakers. Those, in theory, they're all heat pumps. They're moving heat from inside to the outside against a temperature gradient to somewhere uh, warmer. Go ahead and advance the slide there, Lauren. So jumping into the components of any refrigeration cycle, you've got these four components. Now the numbers here are, uh, represent the actual refrigerant lines, but looking at the components, you have the compressor, the condenser, the evaporator, and the uh, expansion device. So number two is the refrigerant suction line going into the compressor. Number three is the discharge line or the hot gas line that's going outside to your, to your condenser. Number four is your liquid uh, line going from your condenser back to your expansion device. And number one is usually what we call a coil distributor. So number two here is the suction. Uh, to explain a little bit what this does or how this works in the refrigerant cycle and how it is that we can move heat from somewhere to somewhere hotter, Picture yourself inside your house with a big canister of air at ambient temperature. If you compress that air a lot, eventually the air in there is going to warm up. The energy that's in that air uh, gets, com gets compressed and that canister could get to say 150 degrees Fahrenheit because you just compressed it so much. Then you can walk outside and put it outside and even though it's 95 degrees outside, that's still much colder than the 150 degrees that your canister of air is. So if you leave it there for a while, that canister will eventually cool down to the 95 degree ambient temperature. Now you can do things to make that go faster, like throw a fan on it so the air moves faster, put some fins around it. You can do things to make your canister cool faster. But once you get this high pressure canister of air cooled to around the ambient temperature of 95, if you bring it back inside and you slowly release it, you expand it, you're going to have a cooling effect. It's going to expand at a temperature much below the 70 degrees that's inside your house. This is similar to an aerosol can being cold and you spray it. If you've ever put some sunscreen on your kids with an aerosol can and they start jumping up and down because it's cold, well, they're correct. That's because you're expanding a, a, a fluid very quickly and you get the, the refrigeration effect. That right there is essentially how the refrigerant cycle and aerosol and heat pumps work. Um, we, we will move. Um, by, by compressing air, 
bringing it outside, letting it cool down, then bringing it back inside. Obviously, we do so continuously using the compressor. We also don't use air. We use refrigerants because we like to control the mixture that's in there, the evaporation and uh, con condensing points. And we want to make sure we don't have different substances in there that will evaporate and condensate at different temperatures. So we use refrigerants. And the other big difference is where a lot of the energy exchange comes in is, is, with, um, is with condensing and evaporating it. So when we take the hot compressor refrigerant outside, we cool it to a point where it actually condenses into liquid. This is why we call it the condenser outdoor. Then we take that high pressure liquid inside and when we expand it, bring it back to lower pressure, then it evaporates. And that's where a lot of the cooling effect comes in. That's what the expansion device is shown here. So essentially, depending on which way you're looking at it, uh, these can either are moving heat from the outside to the inside or the inside to the outside. So the next slide, we're gonna show you here um, two refrigeration cycles. Actually, they're the same, but one of them is in cooling mode and one of them is in heating mode. Advanced. Oh, there you go, perfect, thank you. So what you look at here, one thing to, to remember is that compressors only work in one direction from the suction gas coming in to the discharge gas coming out. So what we don't do if we wanna reverse the cycle and start going the other way, we don't just run the compressor backwards. Uh, similar to a car, most car engines run the same way. If you wanna go in reverse, we use a gearbox to actually go in reverse, but the engine usually spins in the same, uh, same way. This is what we do here with what we call a reversing valve. The reversing valve is kind of like our gearbox so that we can determine in which direction the heat is going. So that's why people differentiate between a cooling only air conditioner and a heat pump. They both, they all have the basic four components of a compressor, a condenser coil, an evaporator coil, an expansion device. The one component that heat pumps have versus the AC cooling only units, whether it's an air conditioner, a mini split, a VRF, is the reversing valve. You need that component or that gearbox to be able to switch back and forth. Go ahead, Lauren, to the next one. So here's an example of your house. On the left in the summer, you have your outdoor unit or your condensing unit rejecting heat. It might be 95 degrees outside, but you've compressed that refrigerant so much. It's at 150 degrees, so it's easily rejecting heat. And because of the exact refrigerant we use, once you start cooling it and it's under pressure, it'll become liquid. Then you bring that back inside and you, you can evaporate that refrigerant in the low 40s, 42, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. And using that, you're gonna cool that air. On the right side, the same system, same components, but that reversing valve kicked in and now we're going the other way. So we are rejecting heat indoors and we are extracting heat from the outside. Now, one of the things that happens if you, if you compare these two scenarios is on the left in the summer, you gotta look at the temperatures and the temperature differences. Uh, in your house, you're trying to maintain around 70 degrees. Outdoors, your worst case scenario might be 95 degrees. You have about a 25 degree temperature difference that the compressor has to work against. That's how much it has to compress uh, the refrigerant in order to be warm enough to be able to reject heat against that big temperature gradient. On the right side, on a warm winter day, we're still trying to maintain 70 degrees inside. If it's 45 degrees outside, uh, that's about the same amount of temperature rise, and that's pretty easy to do. Similar thing as in the summer, no big deal. When it becomes, when it gets colder and colder outside, you can see how that temperature difference start to be bigger and bigger and bigger. If it is 20 degrees Fahrenheit, I still got to heat air that's 70 degrees indoors, and so now I got 50 degrees to make up. So the compressor needs to work harder, more electricity needs to go into it. There's a couple of things that happen as it gets colder. One of them is, again, you have to fight that bigger and bigger temperature rise. There's less and less heat in the air as it gets colder. However, until you get to absolute zero, there's always gonna be heat in the air. Zero degrees might, is cold for uh, us as humans, but for the right refrigerant and the refrigerant cycle, uh, there's no issues there. Think about your freezer, that, that little heat pump you have in your refrigerator is able to keep and extract heat from that freezer and heat your house that way. Uh, so the one thing that happens when it gets colder is 
we have a harder time getting heat. We have to put a little bit more power into it and we tend to get a little bit less heat for every kilowatt of power that we put into it. So Greg, it will talk about something called the COP, which is on the efficiency side and what might happen when it gets colder. The second thing that happens is in the winter on the right, we are essentially air conditioning the outside to heat the inside. And when we air condition something, if you're currently sitting in your house or in an office and it's a hot, humid day out there right now, so it's a great, uh, great day to, to use this example. Uh, if your house, not only if, it, if it's air conditioned, not only is it at a good ambient temperature of 72 degrees, let's say 75, but it's also dry. Because what happens is in the air conditioning system, in the refrigerant cycle, when we evaporate the refrigerant and cool the air, we eventually, the air is going to hit its dew point, we call it it's gonna to start to wring out some water. That is how we dehumidify and keep our buildings comfortable. So when you air condition your house, that's why all these houses and buildings, there's condensate drain pans, condensate pumps, condensate lines that's grabbing all this water that's coming off the coil that we're, that we're wringing out of the air and then putting it somewhere. So in an air source heat pump, the same thing happens in the winter outside. Now we're air conditioning the outside. So if it's 50 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but we are running refrigerant through it at 30 degrees and extracting heat from it, we start to cool that air, eventually it's gonna hit its dew point and we're gonna to start to condensate water on the outdoor unit, which is fine. The fins are designed for the water to, to, to uh, fall off of it. And that's why we, we always think about where the condensing unit is because water is gonna come out the bottom of it. But that's not an issue until it gets below freezing outside. If it gets below 32, now you're condensating water on your outdoor coil and that water is going to freeze when it's, when it's below freezing. Now the systems are designed for this. This is where the term defrost cycle comes in. The condenser is looking at its condenser coil and it's, it realizes because of the amount of heat exchange that it's getting, it realizes that uh, it must have ice on it. Therefore, it reverses the cycle back the other way and puts hot refrigerant through the coil as quickly as it can to melt and defrost that ice, and then it'll go back to it. Which means when it gets colder outside, we have to take into account defrost cycles that'll happen. Now, the good news is when it gets really, really cold, zero degrees, there's just not much water left in that air, so the defrost cycles are a bit more rare. But in the 25 degrees Fahrenheit to 40 degrees Fahrenheit outdoor temperature, there's gonna be some defrost cycles. When you're, looking at an air source, when you're looking at an air source heat pump and how much heat you can get, you have to look at the temperature outside and you have to look at defrost cycles. Now, any manufacturer software properly takes that into account. But that is something to keep in mind. Uh, Lauren, we'll go to the next slide there, please. Now, the benefits of heat pumps, again, Greg will talk about the efficiency, but at the, at the 10,000 foot level, in cooling, these air source heat pumps tend to use inverter compressors. They tend to be better machines than your usual house square cube air conditioner outside, or even than your regular package rooftop units and all of that. So generally in cooling in the summer, you're not using the heat pump function, you're cooling, but you'll do so more efficiently. You should be able to use less power and you have an advantage there in the summer, in the summer in cooling. In the winter though, this is where heat pumps introduce strategic electrification. That is the concept of if we're trying to not burn things to heat our buildings, not burn natural gas in boilers or in furnaces, we need to heat the buildings somehow. We can do electric resistance heating. That's very expensive to do and very inefficient to do, so that tends to be very unpopular. Uh, so the other way that we do this is we extract the heat from somewhere. We either extract it from the air, which is air source heat pumps, or we extract it from the ground or a lake, which is water source heat pumps, which we'll talk about in a second. But that is the concept of, I want to run my building without any fossil fuels. How do I heat the building? This is where heat pumps come in. The picture on the right shows a, a building who has a, a, a PV array, albeit quite small, that could be used to feed four little air source heat pumps there, which in turn move heat from the outside to the inside all winter long. That is one of the steps we take for net zero buildings. Obviously, one of the first steps is to reduce the amount of heat loss, which is what a lot of the passive house uh, standards aim for. And then the air source heat pumps come in and handle the rest. 
uh, next slide here, we're going to go compare air source heat pumps to water source heat pumps. And I'm sure you've heard both. Air source and water source, it refers to where is this machine rejecting or injecting heat? Where is it getting its heat from in the winter? Or where is it releasing its heat uh, in the summer? So an air source heat pump, usually it's an outdoor machine, the condensing unit that's outside, that's air source. Water source heat pump is a machine that's very, very similar, but it's gonna get its heat or dump its heat into a water loop. We normally call it a condenser water loop. And that condenser water loop can either, because at some point you have to, you can put heat in water, but then where does it go? So typical, today's typical Boston condo buildings where I live right now has water source heat pumps, but it's got a boiler in the building and a cooling tower, because at some point in the summer, if everybody is water source heat pump is putting heat into the water, the water can handle a certain amount of heat, but eventually it'll get hot and we're going to turn on a cooling tower. Or in the winter, if everybody is heating, everybody's extracting heat from that water loop, eventually the boiler will come on. But the other way that we use water source heat pump is that condenser water loop. We then try to dump that heat or get the heat from something else like the ground or a lake. And that's your geothermal water source heat pumps. So we'll get, and those tend to be called ground source heat pumps. It doesn't need to be in the ground. They can be in a, in a lake. It isn't, ground source heat pump stands for heat pumps that are meant and rated for geothermal temperature ranges they need to so some manufacturers that have one model water source heat pumps you can use them for both some manufacturers have a specific line of water source heat pump that they call ground source heat pumps that are meant for geothermal applications uh, both these use electricity as their power source whether it's air source or water source and we'll talk about the possible outputs on the next slide the efficiency Again, Greg will dig into it a little bit more. The air source is obviously sensitive to how hot or cold it is outside. The water source or ground source heat pump tend to have uh, to work with water that don't get us, it doesn't get as cold as the outdoor, at the, at the outdoor ambient. <clears throat> Sorry. So we normally design the water loops to, to not get much colder than 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, in a typical geothermal project. So the, the water source heat pump never, ha never has to go extract heat from air at zero degrees, it does so from the water uh, at 50. So that's why head-to-head, uh, -head, a ground source or water source heat pump will be more efficient, but then you're not done. You have to move that water around as well. So you really have to look at the entire energy use uh, of a building. And in terms of capital costs, usually one of the reasons the air source heat pumps are getting so much traction for all electric buildings is because they're usually a lower capital cost. Condensers on the roof, on the side, refrigerant lines in the building, some fan coils and there you go. Whereas the water source heat pumps, you need to handle the water side, geothermal loops, wells, whatever it might be. And next slide there, Lauren. So here we're looking into air source and water source because you might've heard of air to air uh, source heat pumps and air to water. So again, air source means it, it dumps the heat or takes the heat from the air. Uh, the other side of, of the word air to air versus air to water, that means what are you trying to heat or cool? So an air-to-air -air, uh, heat pump, like your mini split, your air conditioner, it's going to reject heat or take heat from outdoor air, outdoor ambient. That's why the first word is air. But then it's also inside the building, it's trying to heat or cool air. So it's air to air. You can do that with distributed systems, uh, ductless or ducted with refrigerant lines. You can do it for a central system, like a central vertical air handler in a closet that could be tied to its own outdoor air, to, uh, air source heat pump. The air to water, Again, it's still outdoors, rejecting or extracting heat from the air, but inside the building, it's heating or cooling water. That's becoming more and more popular as well. Uh, there's air source heat pump chillers out there that will make hot and cold water using the air source heat pump. And usually there's a bit of a drop in efficiency because whatever heat you generate, you now have to go through some heat exchanger and, and transfer that heat over to the water. Then you gotta pump the water around, but there are good reasons to use a hydronic based system air to water one of them is on the domestic hot water side that's that's becoming more and more a technology that's available to heat uh, or cool water including uh, domestic with an uh, an air source machine they exist residentially for for uh, hot water heaters they exist commercially as well there's a big challenge there because you're not just trying to heat air inside a building and keep it at around 70 degrees you're trying to make hot water at 140 degrees so think about that temperature range between the 140 degree water 
and the zero degree outdoor ambient, that's where some of the challenges come in, but the technologies are, are, are definitely catching up. On the water source, a water to air, that is your typical water source heat pump. On one end, it's extracting or rejecting heat to a condenser water loop. On the other hand, it's cooling or heating air. And usually, you know, those are water source heat pumps inside your condo suite that everybody has, uh, or in an office building, you have distributed water source heat pumps and they're connected by condenser water lines. A water to water heat pump, those are more common if you are using a geothermal system. Um, you know, there's a, there's a famous school called King Open that uses water to water uh, chillers that essentially they reject or inject the heat from a geothermal loop, but on the other end, they heat or cool water. And then from there, you can do whatever you want with it in the building. Put it through radiators, put it through air handlers, whatever it might be. And then the next level is there's the heat recovery versions of those chillers. So they're becoming uh, quite popular as well. You can also ha have some that handle domestic hot water and that because they don't need to go extract heat from zero degrees outside, they're extracting it from, let's say, 50 degrees geothermal loops. They tend to be better at generating domestic hot water. Uh, Lauren, go ahead with the next slide. So types of air source heat pumps. If you've been in a hotel with that loud machine under your window called the PTAC, uh, that could be a heat pump. Usually in, in our cold, colder climate, those are just cooling only and the heating is done with electric heat or sometimes even natural gas distributed to all of them. But some do come with a heat pump function. And in warmer climates, that's all they use, heat and cool with that PTAC. The condenser sits on the outside, the evaporator is on the inside, and the compressor and the expansion device are all within that little box. Uh, the mini split or single split you might have heard of, that's your typical air source heat pump. One condenser outside tied to one indoor unit or evaporator or fan coil units. All those words are interchangeable. The compressor is outside on that machine here on the left, uh, and then the uh, evaporator on, is, in, is in the inside on the right. The multi-split is the version of that where you can tie two or three or four or five different evaporators or fan coil units to one outdoor machine. So now you're starting to zone that house as you're using it for. And again, this is an air-to-air -air air source heat pump. Uh, the next slide is going to show you the Big Brother version of that. The commercial version, which is VRF. This again is an air source heat pump. It is extracting or rejecting heat outdoors with that outdoor unit. Uh, but inside the building, it can have many fan coils. It can have up to 20, 30, 40, 50 fan coils on large systems, all tied to one outdoor machine. So these machines are a little larger. They tend to be six feet tall. Uh, they tend to uh, be modular, so you can put multiple of them. Uh, tied together uh, and essentially the compressor lives in that outdoor unit. These are all inverter compressors, which means variable speed compressors. And then all these fan coils or these indoor units, we often refer to them uh, as have their own expansion device. We call those electronic expansion valve. So what happens in these larger VRF systems is that each indoor unit has a thermostat. They each have their own expansion device and they each throttle that expansion device up and down based on how much heating or cooling they need. The outdoor unit then sees where, what each and every indoor unit is doing, what each expansion valve is doing. Fan coil one might be requesting 30% refrigerant or capacity. Fan coil two might be re requesting 80%. The compressor, the outdoor unit sees all of that and the compressor will vary its speed. It'll vary how much refrigerant it pushes up and down based on that, hence the name BRF variable refrigerant flow, you vary the, the, the flow of refrigerant based on demand. Now these, these can also be water source. I'm actually not going to get into that much today, but that outdoor machine that's rejecting or injecting heat from the outdoor ambient, it can be tied to the water cooled, water sourced version of that machine. Everything's the same uh, except uh, now we're interacting with a condenser water loop. It can be a geothermal loop. So there are some large net zero jobs that are geothermal, but still using a VRF. Go ahead, Lauren. Here is what we call the heat recovery version, probably the most popular version of VRF. Everything I said in the previous slide still applies, but this allows us, if we have 30 indoor units on one system, this allows each and every indoor unit to heat or cool independently from each other. 
what we do is no matter who the manufacturer is, we introduce another device called the switch over devices. On the drawing here on the right, you'll see three new little boxes here, gray boxes, uh, just above the fan coils. This shows you a setup where each fan coil gets its own little mini switch over device. Uh, what's more common and, and available is a central version of that switch over device from which you home run piping from all of the fan coils. Essentially, think of that as, a little, as an advanced version of a gearbox, and each fan coil has its own little gearbox. We use a set of valves to do this, and that's what decides whether fan coil one gets cooling or heating, fan coil two gets cooling or heating, and vice versa. And what happens is if some fan coils are cooling and some fan coils are heating, the system is able to exchange heat a little bit and, and save some energy that way. Instead of rejecting all the heat outside, you can reuse it. So this is called the heat recovery VRF system, also known as simultaneous heating and cooling uh, system as well. Uh, next slide there, Lauren. A couple of things about the general benefits of VRF. Uh, usually uh, the systems come with a central controller, usually a touchscreen central controller. It is sort of a pre-packaged uh, building automation system where you can see and control all of the fan coils. Smaller buildings might use that as their mini little building automation system. You can even tie and control other simple things in the building, like your exhaust fans or your fresh air machines. If you're in a larger building, if you have a building automation system by one of the larger controls companies, you can also integrate with VRF systems using the central controller. We use a protocol called BACnet to be able to talk the same language as these automation systems. There are also peak load shedding options with some inputs if you want to tell the system to limit itself either for running on generator uh, power, or whether you're trying to do some peak shedding with the grid and, and all of that, uh, that is an option as well. Uh, flexible design, physical footprint, one of the big things in our market, it's a big retrofit market. How do you add air conditioning or how do you electrify that building and get rid of the boiler without pushing air around in big ductwork without running larger water lines. Here you're running small refrigerant lines. It's a mix of larger hard copper lines, an inch, inch and a half, be the largest lines you'll see, or what we call line sets or soft copper that are just rolled up that you can unroll and flexibly run through uh, the building. Uh, next slide. So a bit more about benefits. I won't talk much about the high efficiency aspect. I touched on it. Greg will get into it in a bit more, uh, a bit more detail. Uh, comfort and flexible operation. One of the things to remember with VRF system is that these are zoning systems. They are meant to have multiple indoor units serving different zones, which is great for buildings that might have areas that need heating while others need cooling. You got that boardroom that needs cooling on colder days. You have the south exposure offices so on and so forth. VRF is meant to zone your building, unlike a standard single zone rooftop with just one thermostat in the space. Uh, quiet operation, uh, I didn't touch on this too much, but a water source heat pump will have a compressor in the unit and that compressor usually is in the space. It's in your condo suite behind a little panel. It's above your head in the ceiling in an office building. What happens with air source heat pumps is that we always put the compressor outside in the machine out there in the condensing unit. So that has a big impact on noise because the, the machine inside the building ends up just being a fan uh, and a coil. So you're just moving air around. Uh, and usually these VRF fan coils are small little direct drive DC motors, very well balanced units that, that have very good sound characteristics. Uh, next slide. Uh, so I'll finish on talking about refrigerants. Uh, it is a, a very hot topic these days. Any refrigerant cycle, any refrigerant system, any piece of air conditioning, essentially short of possibly absorption chillers, use refrigerants. So all these systems we're talking about, whether it's air source heat pumps, water source heat pumps, the ground source heat pumps, those all use uh, some refrigerants. Uh, now we had, uh, we had refrigerants, uh, the first one was Freon back in the 30s. We eventually figured out in the 80s that, that those refrigerants contain chlorine and those, when they get up in the stratosphere, uh, get broken up by the sun rays and the chlorine starts to attack ozone. So we had issues with refrigerants uh, hurting our ozone layer. The Montreal Protocol came along and we've uh, essentially phased out all 
CFCs and HCFCs, all refrigerants with chlorine, those are all gone, including R22. You may be familiar with that. That is an HCFC as of January 1st of 2020. You can't even buy any new R22 unless it's recycled. Uh, so we took care of, of the ozone depletion problem of, of refrigerants, and we've moved on now to using only or mainly HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons that do not have chlorine. For example, R410A is what's currently used in all air source heat pumps and VRF. Again, it does not contribute to ozone depletion. The one thing is, as we, as we use these HFCs, they have more hydrogen atoms in there. They tend to be a little bit more flammable. So what we do is we combine them with some sort of uh, flame suppressant in order to make them less flammable and safer to use. And that uh, increases what we call their global warming potential. What happens is these refrigerants, as they go up in the air, they do a similar thing to what CO2 does when it goes up in the stratosphere in terms of the warming effect. Uh, however, due to their characteristics, their slightly more stable structures, the strength of their bonds, they actually tend to uh, have a much greater impact. So the global warming potential of a refrigerant is, is how much more detrimental to the warming is it compared to the same amount of CO2. And R410A is about 2,000 times worse. Now, of course, we don't want to put refrigerant in the air, trying to keep it inside the machines. Uh, but eventually, if there's leaks, if they're not recycled properly, they do end up in the atmosphere. So there are concerns out there about, all right, all these refrigerants, how do we reduce the global warming potential? There is currently no phase outs in the United States at the federal level for R410A when it applies to air source heat pumps or, um, or VRF. Uh, there are issues with uh, the alternatives that are available out there called A2L refrigerants and putting those in buildings and in systems. There's things on their way, but right now there are no uh, phase outs on those. California is trying to put some forward starting in 2023. Uh, however, they still have the issue of finding an alternative for, for R410A. Uh, if you go to the next slide and the final slide for me. Like I mentioned, if the refrigerants stay inside the systems, there's no big deal. Uh, and if they get recycled, that's great. And I think that's going to be a big part of the focus in the future is, yeah, we're going to look to use less harmful refrigerants to the environment, but we should also just work in keeping them, at keeping them inside the systems more. Uh, so, but the important thing is a air source heat pump is going to run for 15, 20, 25 years. The efficiency at which it runs, how much power it pulls, that has the largest impact on the, what we call the life cycle climate performance of that machine. Because for every kilowatt of electricity we pull, every kilowatt hour, we generate a certain amount of a CO2 because of our current grid, which is improving and there's ways of making your own site renewable. But today your general grid will generate CO2. So over the lifetime of a unit, yes, we're looking to get better refrigerants, but we're also looking to make sure that it does not negatively affect the efficiency. For every point of efficiency that you lose on the system, that's 20 years of pulling most more power. So we really, we're, we're looking into lower GWP refrigerants. Uh, however, we're keeping our focus on the efficiency of these machines, especially with the current state of our grid. Uh, refrigerants is a big topic. There's a link here to a webinar uh, that I presented last week uh, for Nessie. It's an hour long and it goes A to Z on refrigerants and GWP and what's happening in the future for phase outs uh, in North America. Uh, on that front, that is the end of my section. So I'm going to tag uh, my friend Greg here to jump in. Um, Greg, did you see any questions I should quickly address? Or yeah, yeah. Um, uh, a, a few questions question. did come in that we can address. Um, some of them actually fit well with the section I'm going to do, and we can address after. But one okay. on that topic you just touched on is someone asked what the pros and cons of natural refrigerants are. Um, so that might tie a nice answer to that right now. Uh, sure, I, I, I can do that. There's a lot of questions usually around CO2, which is a refrigerant, R744. Uh, CO2 is a great refrigerant because it, uh, it's, oh, it's a global warming potential is one. It's the baseline. Uh, so that part's great. However, CO2 is a high pressure refrigerant. You have to compress it a lot to get it to liquefy. So what that means is all the equipment that we use, the compressor, the coils, and especially for us with air source heat pumps, the piping going through the building, all the connections, all that needs to start being rated for much uh, higher temperature, for much higher pressures, I mean. 
And that's currently one of the barriers is the, 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 the equipment and the safety around that for, um, for CO2. Sometimes people ask about water as a refrigerant. Yes, water is a refrigerant, R718. Uh, however, uh, water doesn't evaporate and condensate and condense at the temperatures that we like. Uh, it does get used in absorption chillers for places that have cogen, cogen plants, but that's not a feasible refrigerant for air source heat pumps. Uh, Greg, I'll leave it at that. There's a follow-up question. Maybe a person can, can write it in there and uh, we can address it at the end. Very good. Thank you, JS. So a big thing you've heard a lot so far about the system, it's right in the name, variable refrigerant flow. We've said variable speed compressors. I want to give you a good idea of what that looks like and what that means. So this graph here, this animation I'm about to show you, is what we consider conventional or traditional systems. This is a constant speed on-off compressor. So think of a rooftop unit, an old AC unit outside of your house. It has one speed. It's either on or off. So if you have a set point for 75 degrees and it's 90 degrees in the space, the compressor is going to turn on and it's going to just go with one full speed until it cools the space down to a certain degree below set point, And then it's going to shut off. At that point, the, till the temperature rises, it will turn back on and it's going on full speed every single time it needs to condition the space. There's a few different effects of that. Um, one of the most common ones is comfort. As you see here, there's a fairly wide temperature swing because you end up cooling the space down too much, wait until it heats back up, cooling it down too much again. There's also wear and tear on the equipment. And more important for this conversation is that is pretty inefficient. So now we're looking at the one efficiency point of a conventional unit. And then you also have the starting and stopping losses of, um, of turning that compressor on and off. In comparison, if we look at a variable speed system, it's gonna see it, we're 90 degrees and need to cool down to 75. It's gonna ramp up significantly, even past the 60 Hertz that you saw on the previous slide. So it's gonna work extra hard at first to get the temperature down to set point where it needs to be. And you'll also notice this isn't just a straight up jagged line. It is, does have a curve to it. That's because these systems are start stop, start, sorry, soft start, which is a much easier for the wear and tear on the equipment, prevents inrush current. Um, but then the real magic happens once we get to set point, you're gonna notice that we are gonna maintain a system, a variable speed system is gonna maintain temperature very close but it's also going to lower the frequency that the compressor is working at. So think of this as cruise control on your car. Instead of going full speed stop, full speed stop, we're pressing on the gas pedal just enough to provide the amount of heating or cooling needed for that space. Um, and the next question comes is why is that important? Why does that matter so much? When you have a a HVAC system in your building, it is sized for the worst case scenario. So that's either going to be the coldest day of the year or the warmest day of the year, depending on what your design conditions are. But in a situation like Boston, that could be you're designing to make sure you can get heat at zero degrees or five degrees and enough cooling in an all glass building at 95 degrees, which is usually what's going to be driving your load. Realistically, you're going to spend about 1% of your time at that full load condition. So the other 99% of the time on a conventional system, you're cycling on and off, which is inefficient. Whereas with a variable speed piece of equipment, you're only working as hard as you need to for those conditions. And a really interesting thing comes from the part load efficiencies. So I think we're actually going to jump on that next. So I'll save that for another picture. So first we'll look at cooling. Every method of cooling out there is going to use a compressor and refrigeration cycle, whether it's chillers, package rooftop units, PTACs in a hotel, window units installed in the side of your building, um, what you have in your house. Cooling is what we've been using a refrigeration cycle for, year, for years. As JS described, heat pumps also use the refrigeration cycle, essentially just in reverse or use the reverse in valve to reverse the reflow of refrigerant so that you're changing where your heat sink and your heat source is. Um, but they work on two different efficiency metrics that we have to look at. 
The first on the coolant side is what a lot of people are used to is EER, energy efficiency ratio. Um, this is coolant output by BTUs divided by electricity input. The important thing to remember is that this measures efficiency at a peak load. So this is only at full load conditions, which as I described before is less than 1% of the time in, your, in the average building around here. But it's a standard efficiency metric that's used. So you're gonna find an EER on a conventional on-off compress compressor unit and you're also gonna find an EER on a VRF piece of equipment. You're also probably gonna be surprised to see that those numbers are not too far off from each other. Um, if you don't know this piece of information, you're gonna look at that and say, these two pieces of equipment are very similar in efficiency. That is not the case. Um, peak load is actually the most inefficient point of the system. Um, if you're at 100% input and 100% output of your capacity, that's your peak load. But if you look at a variable speed piece of equipment and it is at 50% capacity, so you only need half the heating capacity of the unit, you aren't at 50% power input, it's exponential. So it's similar to a fan curve, you're actually probably closer to 30% power input to provide 50% of the capacity. So the real efficiency and the real magic of this comes from the efficiency gains you get the other 99% of the year when you don't have to operate at full load Instead, you're at a reduced capacity, which is significantly less power input. So how we look at that is called IEER, the Integrated Energy Efficiency Rating. So what that does is it's looking at a weighted average of EER values at different temperatures. So IEER actually looks at four different temperatures in four different load-in scenarios. Um, and then it will use a weighted average saying, okay, you spend 1% of your time at the highest temperature at full load, you spend 60% of your time at 75% load, you spend 25% of your time at 25% load, et cetera. And it's a formula that AHR has that you can view, but it's four temp separate points that give you a, give you a weighted average there. Um, so even on a piece of variable speed equipment, it's gonna have EER, all AHR rated equipment does, and it's also gonna have an IEER. So the main point I wanna get across from this is that you may look at several pieces of equipment and EER is similar, but that's just telling one piece of the story. EER on a conventional piece of on-off equipment is an accurate way to tell its efficiency. EER on a variable speed piece of equipment is only telling you part of the story. You really need IER to determine how efficient that system is gonna be um, during the actual real life operation of that system. Once we get to the heat, heat inside, um, commercial heat pump efficiency or really all heat pump efficiency is measured by coefficient of performance. That's energy in divided by energy out. Um, AHR has us rate this equipment. You're gonna see on all our data sheets published at both 47 degrees Fahrenheit and 17 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, one thing worth mentioning there is that most manufacturers will publish all their data on their capacity output and power input at different temperatures. So you can actually come up with a graph that shows a COP at any different outdoor temperature. And this is really important because the COP of a heat pump is gonna change based on outdoor temperature whereas the COP of some other conventional or fossil fuel sources is not gonna change. And you have to deal with fuel switching there. But to give you an idea of the range, at 50 degrees, a heat pump could have a COP of almost five. It could be near around 4.8, 4.9. At 25 degrees, a heat pump could have a COP of three. And then down at zero degrees, it could have a COP of 2.3. So it goes down as the temperature drops, and then what you have to do is look at, look at your bin data, look at how many hours you spend at each temperature range to really get a good idea of what your, your weighted average COP is for based on the weather in your region compared to what your other, other comparable heat source could be. And then you'll see smaller units use HSPF, um, similar to SEER on the coolant side. This is more for the split systems. This is a heat and seasonal performance factor where it takes in, um, similar to IER, it's looking at over the course of a season, a typical heat in season, 
what is its efficiency going to be, which is useful for comparing systems among each other. Um, but you won't see it on larger equipment. You're not going to see it on equipment that's over 65,000 BTUs. So another thing to add into this is efficiency isn't the only thing you have to look at. There's a difference between efficiency and cost effectiveness. If we look at some general technology here, a furnace or boiler can be anywhere from a COP of 0.85 to 0.99. I mean, the newer high, high efficiency condensing boilers can get very high efficiency, but they're still not perfect. They're not at one. Electric resistance heat, which many people consider to be, to be bad, very expensive to use, very inefficient, is actually perfectly efficient. I mean, all the power you put in is converted to heat and heat in your space. The difference you're seeing is the cost effectiveness right now is that it's the cost difference between fossil fuel and electricity is what makes electric resistance more expensive. That's where it's great getting to the heat pump side where all heat pumps are electrically driven and heat pumps are more efficient because they transfer rather than generate heat. We're not just taking the power and making that heat. We're actually pulling heat from the outside and bringing it inside, which is why you'll see COPs of greater than one. I mean, you can be a COP of two at sub-zero temperatures all the way up to four or five, depending on your equipment type. So not only do you have to consider the different types of efficiency metrics between, um, between different types of equipment, you also have to keep in mind the fuel switching when you compare it to a furnace or boiler or a heat pump. And on that same efficiency note here, and someone did ask a question as far as, um, asked a question about electric heaters in, um, electric heat used in VRF systems, which I think was answered there or answered in the chat, but I'll also answer it here. Um, efficiency and capacity do drop and are lower in colder weather, but the technology is there and, if anyone has used heat pumps 10, 15 years ago, it's come a long way since then. Um, both VRF, so the commercial VRF systems, and probably the newer thing over the past five or six years is the ability for the mini split heat pumps that were traditionally used in residential use. The technology has improved in the cold climate capabilities where the ability of these units to extract heat can go well below negative 10 degrees outside. A v there are VRF systems that have capacity down to negative 25 degrees because yes, negative 25 degrees is very cold, but there's still heat in the outside air. And as long as we can make refrigerant colder than that, it will absorb heat and we can transfer that heat inside the building. Um, based in Boston here, if we look at um, our typical zero degrees, even at um, zero degrees out or negative five degrees out for what I'm looking at here, we are going to have a COP of greater than two. And then even more as you start looking at your, um, look at how much time you spend at each temperature range. I know this isn't, it, it can change every year, but if you look at an average of bin data, you're spending probably 75 hours below 15 degrees. So the big thing here is that it can produce the heat at negative, negative temperatures. It is still a decent efficiency. It's better than electric heat, but you're going to spend less time there than you are at the slightly more mild conditions where the system is even more significantly efficient. This is where backup heat um, or electric resistance comes into play. Um, years ago, decades ago, you would install a heat pump and you'd often install an electric heater with it because heat pumps used to, I mean, 15 years ago, a heat pump didn't operate below 30 degrees. That was kind of the old convention was, anything below 30 degrees, you're going to put an electric resistance heater in. That's not needed anymore. You can design, and many people do in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, upstate New York, buildings where the heat pump is their only source of heat using cold climate models that are capable of providing heat at sub-zero temperatures. This means that backup heat, whether it's a older existing system, a gas-fired system, or even just electric resistance heat, isn't needed anymore. Um, if there is functional and fairly efficient system already in the building, I probably wouldn't recommend ripping it out because you might be able to save some costs 
on choosing what's most efficient at the time or making your system smaller because you already have a heat source. But if you're building a new system or you uh, have to completely rip out what's there, you don't have any requirement anymore to put in auxiliary heat. Systems are capable of, of heating below and below zero and well below zero. Um, and it's been fairly common in, in recent years. Um, and then ground source heat pumps, which JS touched on, um, those are a different story because those aren't going to be as affected by outdoor temperature. Because instead of an air source unit is using the outdoor temperature as its heat sink, whereas a ground source heat pump is using water from the ground, which is fairly consistent. So whether it's 20 degrees or negative 10 degrees outside, that groundwater is going to be relatively consistent and you're going to see a more steady COP with that system. All right, um, so that's it on efficiency. I see there are a few questions that came in that uh, are being answered or we'll make sure to answer during the, um, during the question and answer. Um, but one thing I wanna to touch on that links to efficiency and just links to choosing what type of heat pump system you're gonna use is maintenance. Um, often these systems are sold as low or no maintenance, which is true. They are much less maintenance than conventional systems. Inverter-driven compressors, high-efficiency DC fan motors all lead to long equipment life, 20, 25 years before anything would need to be replaced. Um, and we see a lot of systems that have been installed well longer than that. All the components are last to, designed to last the life of the system. Um, there is no regularly scheduled belt replacement, fan motor replacement, compressor replacement. A well-operating system, everything should operate or should last the life of the system. This does not mean that basic maintenance can be forgotten about. Checking filters, cleaning filters, or replacing filters on your indoor units regularly is really important for both having the system continue to operate well, but for its efficiency. One of my favorite anecdotal stories is a customer that had a VRF system installed in one of their buildings for, I mean, this was a while ago, but they had it for five or six years by the time they got a hold of me. And they said they've been using it in the cooling season for years with no issues and all of a sudden it just doesn't work. They can't cool their space. And we were talking with them and they, they were to say I was a facility manager that was trying to get things up and running before their contractor could get there. And someone on our team said, okay, well, when was the last time you checked the filter? And they said, I don't, well, I, I'm not the one that maintains this building, but where is it? It was a ductless unit, so we had them pull the face down. And when they pulled the filter up, you could hear the airflow over the phone increase and almost instantly said, oh yeah, there's the cold air coming out. With these types of systems, especially once you get into VRF systems, you're looking at all sorts of different indoor unit types where you may not have the conventional ducted unit with a lot of external static pressure that can push to a dirty filter, is these ductless units get a lot of their efficiency from smaller fan motors because they're not pushing through duct work. That also means they are not going to be able to push to a filter that hasn't been touched in five years. Um, filters should still be a regular part of your maintenance um, protocol. Keeping outdoor coils free and clear of debris, um, depending on where you mount them, you, we always recommend having them up on stands in a place where they're not going to have snow build up against them from snow drifts. Um, but you just want to take a look at these coils and make sure there's not um, animals, leaves, Dunkin' Donuts, cups. I mean, we've seen it all, but in dirty areas where it's kind of stuff can build up against the wall, you just want to make sure that these coils are unobstructed for airflow. And then the next biggest maintenance thing I see is condensate removal systems. If you have the opportunity to use a gravity drain, do it every single time. Gravity always wins. Unfortunately, every space doesn't allow that. So you're often using some sort of condensate pump, which you're gonna to need to maintain. I mean, condensate pumps are typically a weaker point of a system. They can get clogged with debris, with junk, um, and fail or not have an alarm set up on them. So you do wanna make sure that your condensate removal system is maintained, flushed out, cleared, cleaned on a regular basis so that when you're in the cooling mode, it can move the uh, condensate away from that indoor unit and out of your space. And then every manufacturer has different service tools that can be used to, used to record system data. Um, 
to record system data, ensure the system's operating as designed. Typically, as a manufacturer, when someone starts a system up, we ask them to do a runtime recording and send it to us so we can make sure that everything's operating as expected, everything looks like it's in within range, and we'll issue extended warranties based off of that. Having that tool, and most contractors do now, having these tools allow someone to take a recording five years later and compare it back to that initial recording and see if anything changed, or even just to plug it in and see if the values are still in line and help them troubleshoot if there's an issue with the system, if something changed, or if everything's plugging along exactly as it should, should be. Um, before I leave the efficiency talk, a question just came in called, given the cold weather performance, why does every engineer want to pair the system with a backup boiler? That's a great question. Um, and that really is always gonna depend on where the system's being installed and what the requirements are by either the engineer or the owner. Um, there are some engineers that I work with on a daily basis that have for the past eight years used heat pumps as their only source of heat, heat in buildings in this climate. I've also worked with some engineers who still consider heat pump new technology and want a boiler for a backup no matter what they're doing in the building. Oftentimes it might be a building where a boiler is needed for something else. So beer up is serving a certain part of your building and then you have, let's say a hotel is a good example where you have a large um, guest room area served by VRF, then you might have a, a large ballroom that's using a conventional air handler with a hot water coil. If you have that boiler on site, oftentimes people will use it as a backup source because it already exists there. Um, but the big thing is that a, the boiler is not a requirement. Heat pumps can and are used as the only source of heat but often a designer will have different reasons why they choose to do so, whether it's the owner said to them they wanna have redundancy and never have to worry about heat, so they'll put multiple sources in, the boiler there is needed for something else, or maybe even just a, the boiler existed and why rip it out? I mean, if it's there and it's in good shape, you can still use it and have that as, a, um, have that as an option. So you have quite a few different options when it comes to um, system types. Here are outdoor units. So these are the air source units, which are the most common. So there's, there's water cooled as well, which is not shown here. Um, but you're looking at two different system types here. On the left side of your screen is what you typically think of a VRF. These are larger systems. Um, so, for instance, that bottom right picture on the stands here is 40 tons of VRF on the roof of a school. Um, and this is typically how we want them installed for a cold climate or for a um, extreme weather situation. Up on snow stands, hoods and guards to protect the coils and the fan, um, and in a place where they're protected or, or can't have snow drifts build up against them. Um, on the other side of the screen, you'll see air source heat pump mini splits. So these are conventionally the systems you would see used in your house. I mean, they started 30 years ago as a bonus room above a garage, a three seasons porch, but these are now what are typically used both in residential as whole home solutions. Um, in my own house, I have a multi-zone air source mini split that serves all my heating and cooling needs. But more commonly we're seeing now is that these mini splits can be used in commercial applications as well. Um, so you could have a situation where you choose to do a multifamily residential building with a, this setup of VRF units all sitting on a stand. You can also choose to do it. So that'd be a central, central VRF. You get heating and cooling from the system and heat recovery, or you could have that same building. This is actually a photo from a residential building out in Western Mass where they gave every unit its own dedicated its own dedicated mini split system. Um, and I know JS talked about it a little bit, I'll add in because I saw another question come in of when would you use a multi-zone system or a single zone system like this? VRF systems do have the ability to be, to have energy allocation on them. So individually meter the energy usage of, um, of each indoor unit. That gets difficult in Massachusetts as that is not something that is not explicitly allowed. Um, actually, energy allocation is in Massachusetts widely considered not allowed. 
and I'd have to get an update. I know there's been a, um, a few public hearings on a new bill that's been introduced to allow it. Um, so often people choose mini splits in a setting where they want to give individual ownership of energy bills or even just individual ownership of a system um, in a condo setting. The great thing about the technology now is air source heat pump mini splits and air source heat pump uh, BRF systems share the major technology that we're talking about here. They, they both have variable speed compressors and they both have full climate capabilities. So in general, your efficiency is not gonna be all that different. You're, you're using the same type of compressor, using the same, um, the same concept behind what we're doing with a few differences. So the mini splits are gonna have shorter line lengths, like typically of 100 to 200 feet, where the VRF units have thousands of feet of piping. Um, and then a VRF system is gonna have, if you go with the most common one, the heat recovery system, you are gonna get heat recovery with an air source VRF system that you're not gonna get with a mini split system. So if I had to say overall, the VRF would probably be uh, slightly more efficient because you get heat recovery. But in general, the real, the real efficiency gain of these systems is a variable speed compressor and you're getting that same compressor whether you do a smaller mini split or a larger air source heat pump. Um, now I'm gonna to touch on their different indoor unit types and options. We could spend all day going through every detail of each one. So I'm gonna give what I find are the most common uses of each of these and maybe one or two interesting facts about them. Um, and then if you have more you wanna dig into, we can hit it during the Q&A. In general, what you're seeing will work for something, these types are available with VRF, both air source and water source, and in split systems have versions that um, are very similar to what you're gonna see in these pictures. First being a wall mounted unit. Um, becoming more and more common in the United States, if you travel overseas at all, it is extremely common to be used in almost every other country, um, except for here. If you have a project where you care most about efficiency and you want the lowest first cost possible, wall mounted units are the way to go. Architects hate them. I uh, hear complaints from architects all the time. I'm of the opinion you forget about them once they're on the wall for a while, but these are the most efficient units and by far the least expensive units as far as indoor units go. They're the most efficient because you are not pushing through several feet of ductwork with this. It has a much smaller fan motor where you're just conditioning the space that you're in rather than pushing through ductwork, pushing through a dirty filter. And then because they're so common everywhere else, there's just a huge difference in this, the scale of uh, cost efficiencies there. Um, so that's a common thing that I'm sure JS gets as well is this needs to be the most efficient, have the most controllability, and also needs to be the absolute least expensive you can make it. Um, and then they usually say they don't want wall mount, they want the more expensive ducted units to hide everything as well. Um, so consider these, any architects on board, I'm sorry, I know you're cringing as I say this, um, but these units are great and I, I think we're gonna see them used more and more as we move forward. Next up is a seal and suspended unit. Um, I call these classroom units and this picture is a perfect example of, these have a lot of airflow, they can be installed suspended from the ceiling up in a corner and cover a large room. And most importantly, they can be put out of the way where no one can touch them. This is not the most attractive unit that any manufacturer makes. It is fairly big, but it is in a place where students cannot touch it, put crayons in it, throw their backpacks on top of it, um, throw books on. It is out of the way and, and prevents people from making the situation worse. Um, so the common place I'll see this is classrooms then also um, in something like a kitchen where maybe what it looks like doesn't matter as much, you just want a lot of airflow from a single point. Then there's floor standing units, both exposed and concealed ones. Um, these are very similar to the cabinet unit heaters that, that are seen all over the city. Um, here's a condo project in Boston that used one under each window. I really like these because they allow you to put them right where your biggest source of heating and cooling needs are. So in this building, these old historic windows, um, having just this unit 
one, there was no space for duct work. They wanted the exposed ceiling, but this put the heat in right where it was needed near the window, which was the biggest source of heat loss in the building. Um, and allows for some flexibility there as far as how it's piped. And then here's an example of a same exact unit, just a different cabinet type um, where you can conceal them. So this is actually, this mill work you're seeing previous to these units being put in, and you can see them on the left is where they have the access panels for them. Um, this large room had radiators just for heating. When that system uh, became too old to function, it was ripped out. They ran refrigerant piping through all of the chases that they had for the old steam piping and then replaced all the radiators with these concealed units. And now they had both heating and cooling from a much more efficient system. And by the time they were done with it, the room looked the exact same because they were able to rebuild all that millwork just with the addition of some grills for the airflow. Um, I saw a question come in is, yes, floor stand-in units can be used for both heating and cooling. Next up are uh, ducted units, and they come in a few different sizes. Medium static ducted unit is probably the most common, the most standard. Um, this is a, when we talk about medium static, low static, high static, that's its ability to push through ductwork and filters and other stuff in the air distribution system. It's also gonna closely be related to the system's profile. So a Medium static ducted units, probably 10 to 12 inches tall, which is fine for most office buildings, which is why it's the most common. Then we have a low profile ducted unit, which can't handle nearly as much duct work. You're gonna, it has a lot less static pressure capability, but are really common if you think of a, a high end hotel that you walk in where at the entryway or near the bathroom, the ceilings dropped a couple of inches and that's where the fan coil sits and the ducted unit sits or the duct work sits and allows for high ceiling heights and you're just going with a couple feet of ductwork. So this is, instead of being 10 to 12 inches tall, you're looking at seven to eight inches tall. And then on the opposite side of that, there's much bigger units that have the ability for a lot of ductwork. Um, so these high static ducted units can handle uh, up to an inch of external static, so a lot more ductwork, but they're also gonna be significantly taller. I believe they're at 14 to 16 inches, depending on manufacturer, um, and will take up more ceiling space. So you really size these ducted units. Architects love them because you can hide them in the ceiling. And then you size it based off both your ceiling height requirements and then how much duct work you have that the unit needs to push through. Uh, then we have the um, increasingly common is the vertical ducted unit. Um, these come from most manufacturers as multi-position units. So it can be vertical ducted kind of if you think the high rise in the city, they usually use vertical units in the corner where they have the corner stubbed out um, to fit the unit. Um, or it could just be multi-position installed inside a, um, a closet somewhere. It's just a different configuration of a ducted unit compared to the pancake ones. Um, then we start getting into some of the other ductless units. So a one-way cassette, uh, the original intent of these was to make a um, to make something that's very similar to a linear diffuser. This is self-contained. It's gonna have one-way airflow direction. And here's actually a picture of an office building where they're all along, if you look down that picture, all down the exterior wall, it's where a linear diffuser would be against the window, except it is all ductless connected through refrigerant pipe in there. Much more common are the four-way cassettes. Um, these are seen in conference rooms, drop ceilings, uh, really everywhere. I've seen them using restaurants and residential. There's large 33 by 33 inch cassettes and small 24 by 24 inch cassettes. Um, the most notable thing is that the filter's in the middle there, so it pulls air in from the middle and then it has four veins where it distributes air out of those veins and the veins can change position. Really the most relevant thing you need to know is that the four-way cassette can be entirely maintained from the bottom. The full faceplate flips down and you have access to everything, whereas the four-way small cassette is typically gonna need an access panel to access the control board, the condensate piping, um, and all the connections for any future maintenance. So the bigger ones are, you, they look bigger, which isn't always great for all spaces, but they're fully accessible from the bottom, and the smaller ones are gonna need an access panel. Uh, 
A uh, question that came in, I'm glad someone asked this about what about outside air requirements for each of these configurations? Um, I'm going to talk into how ventilation is typically handled. The thing to remember is there's both how you bring ventilation air into the building than how you introduce it to the space. So all of the options I showed except for the wall mount unit has some way to introduce some amount of ventilation air. Ducted units are easy because the ventilation air gets brought into the duct system. Um, the four ways you have the ability to bring ventilation air directly to, we give four inch round knockouts on the four way units to introduce ventilation air to be distributed by the fan coil. Um, the only unit that there's no way to bring ventilation air to is those wall mount units. Those you have to bring the air directly to the space. Um, but on that topic, that brings us right into the ventilation overview. Um, where I'll dig into this a little bit more. So all buildings require some sort of fresh air ventilation. For a lot of years, buildings depended on windows and passive air leakage for ventilation. Not a great solution because it's inefficient, wastes energy, doesn't really ensure air quality. A lot of times it's just measured from how much of the space is in a certain number of feet from the window. Um, basically now, especially with the most recent Massachusetts codes, using windows and passive air for ventilation is more and more strict and pretty much non-existent. So most buildings nowadays, any new construction is gonna have some sort of ventilation system. VRF systems, mini splits, both of those are just meant to provide the heating and cooling for the space. And then you have a few options for what you're gonna do with ventilation. So there is always the option of bring in untreated outside air and introduce it to your space or bring it into a fan coil. So it's possible for you to bring untreated outside air, have it pull into a, the ductwork system on your ducted unit, and that's an added load on the ducted unit that as it runs, it's treating that unconditioned air and dump it into the space. I wouldn't recommend this for any significant amount of air. This is not an efficient way to do it. There's a lot better options out there. So that's when you start to get into ERVs and DOAS systems, so dedicated outdoor air systems. Um, and there's a lot of different options based on building type, building occupancy, what's existing there. And I'm gonna break it into two categories and I'm gonna break those down a little bit more. Um, to start, you have central ventilation or zoned ventilation. So if you look at it, let's consider a 60,000 square foot office building. You could have one large rooftop unit that brings in ventilation air and it then distributes through ductwork through the entire building. So that would be one central DOS unit that is bringing ventilation to the entire building. You can then take that same building and instead use one smaller ERV, so energy recovery ventilator, on a per zone or per floor basis. So that could be a small ERV that takes outside air in, exhausts inside air out, it will have some heat exchange and some moisture exchange in that process so that the fresh air you bring in is somewhat treated more so than just fresh air. Um, and that's much more efficient. And you can do that at, I've seen buildings where they do one floor, each floor gets its own ERV. I've seen each wing of a floor gets its own ERV. I've even seen spaces where, I mean, you can do a residential building where every single condo will get its own ERV. So that's kind of a distributed ventilation uh, model versus a conventional office building would be one system that handles the entire building. Once you figure that out, then you have to decide what type of, how do you want to bring your air to the space as far as, um, of course, there's the unconditioned space that, um, unconditioned air that you could just bring in directly if you wanted to. Next up would be energy recovery where you're transferring energy from the exhaust air to the incoming air to improve system efficiency. Or then you can add mechanical heating and cooling and deliver neutral air. So if it's zero degrees outside and it's 70 degrees inside, you're pulling 70 degree air out through an ERV and pulling zero degree air in, the air you bring to the space is probably gonna be about 40 degrees. So it's better than zero, but it's still something you're likely gonna wanna condition further by bringing through a fan coil, which will be an added load on the system, or you're gonna to wanna to drop it into a space in a place where it's not gonna affect occupant comfort. The best way to do it is have a DOES system 
where you are bringing in outside air, running it through an energy recovery wheel or an energy recovery plate or core, whatever it may be, and then having mechanical heating and cooling to bring that temperature either up to neutral, so heat it from 40 degrees to 70 degrees, or take that air and cool it significantly, so you'll bring it down to 55 degrees, wring all the moisture out of it in the summer, and then reheat it, heat it back up, so that you're delivering 70 degree air in the summer, that's all your latent loads taken out of it, so that you're, you're dehumidifying the air and bringing that to the space to keep the space nice and dry. And the technology has come to a point where that mechanical heating and cooling can also be done from VRF systems and heat pumps with custom DX coils, LEV kits, um, to bring that heat and cooling coil to a ERV to make up a system that fits your build and design. Um, so that is the end of my part for today. Uh, we do have a half hour saved for questions and it looks like we do have a lot of them. My next question is about filtration with COVID-19 ash rays, talking about MERV-13 filters in the guideline. Most existing, not lab spaces aren't necessary design for the additional pressure drop. Is there flexibility in filters and the different configurations with heat pumps and VRF? So that is a great question. Obviously, filtration IAQ is uh, very much a growing topic. Uh, so yes, MERV-13 are options for a lot of the fan coils, especially the ducted fan coils that we have. You do have to watch for the static pressure. Uh, anything that's a, called a low static unit, which is usually just an eight inch deep unit that we use for hotel above the bathroom, won't be able to handle MERV 13, but medium and high static units can handle 0 0.6, 0 0.8 inches, will be able to handle uh, MERV 13. You may have to just do a little quick recommissioning of that fan. So yes, MERV 13 is an option. When you get to a wall mounted unit, not really. Some of the larger cassette units do have MERV 13 uh, options uh, and the other ductless units tend not to. One of the topics with VRF and air source heat pumps when it comes to the health of, bu of buildings is it is a decentralized system. So just the idea that you do have a unit in each office, let's say, instead of a central system that returns all of the air from all the offices filters it and sends it back, there can be a lot of cross-contamination between spaces. So one of the angle, one of the aspects of VRF is that we're not uh, recirculating air between zones if we design a system to have a unit in each zone. Obviously MERV 13 helps, uh, although it does not necessarily address viruses and bacteria because of their size. So you need to start looking at possible uh, UV lighting solutions in the fresh air units or in some of the terminal units start looking into ionization solutions and humidity control is a big deal. One of the places to really look at for healthy buildings is that 35 to 55, 60% RH, which is where A, it's comfortable for humans, but it's also the worst spot for viruses and bacteria to duplicate. Um, so low RH, so buildings that are not humidified in the winter, uh, that can be an issue. And obviously buildings without air conditioning that get high RHs uh, can also be a breeding ground for viruses. More questions, I think there are follow-ups. Best way to circulate clean air, re-COVID. Um, I, I think I addressed that. Obviously your fresh air units that, that Greg was talking about uh, are a big part of that. You have to think about any, heat recovery device, whether there's cross-contamination happening there. Um, so yes, it, it, the, increasing the amount of outside air is not necessarily the solution. You need to think about it intelligently, thinking about the cleanliness of the air from the outside. So it seems like the widespread angle is not just to really bump up outside air, although that does help with dilution. Uh, it, it seems, my belief is the future is gonna look at all of these different technologies that I mentioned and incorporate some or all of those uh, to try and help. Greg, I don't know if you have a comment. The following question was uh, similar, I think. Is it a far better approach to virus distribution to increase fresh air with heat recovery? Higher filtration is more heat easily handled by ERV fans. Um, this gets such into the world of different opinions here. We uh, you know the different uh, schools of thoughts out there. Uh, increasing fresh air can help in some form and so can filtration. Uh, I don't think that nobody yet has a definite uh, answer that is agreed upon across the board. Greg, I'll let you uh, jump in here. 
Yeah, um, well said, JS. I don't disagree with anything you said. My comments would be is there, especially with something like COVID and viruses and bacteria, um, there is gonna be no one size fits all answer. The answer is gonna be some combination of air filtration, uh, air treatment, such as UV lights are becoming very common, um, ventilation air, and it's gonna be looking at your specific system and what, what combination is gonna fit your needs and your capabilities in your system. Um, some ducted units are gonna have, you, there are ways to increase the static pressure depending on how it was originally installed. You can install filters, larger oversized filters at an angle, reduce pressure drop. Um, there's space to install UV lights in some units. Um, it might be you already have a DOS system and you just really need to change the filters out on that and kick up the outside air. But it's, it's unfortunately not gonna be a one size fits all. You have to look at all of these things together. Um, one question that came up that I thought was good that I'll jump on is what are common installation mistakes? Um, I'm gonna change that to what are both common design and installation mistakes and give what I think are my top three. The first would be uh, making sure your system is properly sized. Um, ripping out the old system and putting in a new VRF system that is just the same capacity as what you had before uh, is often a recipe for disaster because the previous system you've had might have been greatly oversized or undersized. Um, you do want to do a load calculation and make sure that you are installing a, a right size system, which is going to be the most efficient system you can put in. Once it comes to the installation side, the two that I like to point to, I'm from Boston, I deal in the Northeast climate. First would be use what that manufacturer recommends for cold weather accessories. And I believe that's actually gonna be in the Lexington presentation tomorrow, but snow stands, base fan heaters, um, snow hail guards, whatever that specific piece of equipment needs uh, to last through severe weather, that's often something to see that I see pulled out because it's, oh, well, we can save money by removing all these accessory items. And then people wonder why they have issues in the middle of a blizzard. Um, so a lot of that stuff's intentional is making sure that that's installed. And then after that, I would say the biggest installation mistake I see is that on the piping side. So the, the refrigerant piping is the least controlled thing in the system because it's not done in the factory. It's not tested in a factory. Um, it's often done in the field under a rush. Building's got to open soon. You got to be done by this date. Um, would be not doing the proper pressure test and evacuation of a system. When a pressure test and evacuation of a refrigerant system is done, um, that will catch your large and small leaks and lead to a, a long lifetime for the system. And we still see people skipping out on a pressure test or skipping out on a full evacuation because they just don't have the time they'll let it hold for an, an hour of pressure instead of 24 hours, or they'll just do a quick evacuation for an hour instead of a triple evac to remove moisture from the system. Um, so those are the corners we see cut that are kind of the biggest installation mistakes I see. There's a question here from earlier. Is it more efficient to run a system in dry mode or cooling mode? And I was thinking about it. I'm not sure how to answer that. Dry mode is a mode that units can be put into where we try to wring out as much moisture in the space using our fan coils without overcooling it. It'd be easy to just put the set point to 60 degrees and let the unit air condition until the space is dry, but then it becomes cold and uncomfortable. This dry mode tries to lower the fan speed, lower the velocity of the air over the coil and wring out more, more moisture by extending the operational time. So my guess is going to say that putting it regular cooling mode is the most efficient because that is how the units are programmed and optimized for. And then the refrigerant temperatures that can move up and down to optimize efficiencies, they get to do their thing. When you get into dry mode, we tend to lock in a, a colder refrigerant temperature and extend runtime. So I'm going to say that cooling mode is more efficient than dry mode. And dry mode usually only gets used in conjunction with something looking at the RH and putting the unit in and out of dry mode when it's needed. Greg, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, I will, I'll touch on that too. I agree with your, your analysis there, JS, but one interesting point to share. Um, so I've looked at dry mode quite a bit. And what's interesting is dry mode works really well in a European or Japanese setting where they typically have higher cooling set points. So dry mode is going to do a really good job when you're your coolant set point 75 degrees, 76 degrees. 
Um, what we found is that when your coolant set point is lower, I mean, we see in the US, we see most people having coolant set points of 70 degrees or 68 degrees or whatever it may be. With these really low coolant set points, um, we've seen that coolant mode is actually better than dry mode for wringing moisture out. But then again, like you brought up, your lower your set point, the more your energy use is going to be. Um, so it's kind of finding a happy medium for what your set point is. I think the best solution is, though, is a properly sized system should be constantly removing moisture from the system because it's not cycling on and off. And if you have excessive humidity, figure out where that humidity is coming into your building. Um, a common one just even in houses is a, the refrigerant pipe and leaves the exterior wall of a wall mount unit. Um, did they seal that hole up or is that just where humid untreated air is being pulled into the space and causing humidity issues? Um, what's your ventilation air? Is, are you using an ERV? or are you just bringing in fresh untreated air is, I think it's kind of an ounce of prevention is a pound of cures. If you can find out where that moisture is coming in in the first place, it's gonna be better than dealing with it on the cooling or the, the dry mode side. Uh, Greg, there's a couple of questions about air conditioners and automobiles and whether it's different and conceptually, like I talked about, uh, it's a different, it's a similar concept that uses the refrigerant cycle and there is a certain amount of fresh air coming in. Uh, but generally, the, the, it is very different technologies. They use usually different refrigerants. But I think most cars are on 134A, and now there's yeah. a 2 hour refrigerants. But Greg, you uh, maybe you can jump in since uh, this is a front of cars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'd say most cars are, yeah, they're using 134A, which is a different type of refrigerant. Um, they're typically, they, they have the, all the same components. They have a compressor. They have evaporator, condenser. Um, they typically are single speed single speed on the air conditioning. And then they're, I mean, most cars are using kind of a more complicated than you see in most houses as far as a zoning damper system between different sides of the car, front, rear, driver, passenger. Um, but that would be a conventional AC system. The big difference with cars is cars have an incredible heat gain from all the windows. So your air conditioning in your car is just gonna run a lot because it is just constantly, it's a very steady load when the sun is on a window. Um, versus a building, which kind of behaves a little bit different. Um, but yeah, it's all the same basic concepts as far as what, like the, the refrigeration cycle hasn't changed much in the past couple decades. Uh, there's a question from earlier. What is the rough cost differential between heat pump and installation of central air conditioning system? Uh, to try and keep this quick, the one comment I'll make on that is if you are considering installing a central air conditioning system or if you already have one and you want to convert that to an air source heat pump but you're converting that to a central ducted air source heat pump then your installation costs are quite similar the equipment will have a slight premium but you're still your furnace your vertical furnace gets replaced with a vertical air handler that can be connected to the same existing ductwork similar setup maybe a horizontal unit as well and you're tying it to an air conditioner outside, except now it's a smaller horizontal discharge air source heat pump or mini split light condensing unit. Uh, you just don't have a gas connection anymore and you're just using it as the air source heat pump. The installation is very similar, slight premium on the equipment. However, a lot of people think of air source heat pumps as the multi-split system. So now if you're comparing your central air conditioner to a system that's also zoned with four or five wall mounts throughout the house and having to run pipes through it, then you're in a different category on the cost. You're, you're, you're going to go up uh, from you know a few thousand dollars for the uh, uh, central air conditioner or uh, even a central air source heat pump to maybe a ten thousand, fifteen, even twenty thousand dollar project, depending on how many of these wall mounts or different units you're putting throughout the building. So there is quite a bit of a difference between central air source heat pumps, central ducted air source heat pump, and the multi-split systems. Well said. Um, last question sitting here is with solar PV, we know that the inverter is the weak link in the system. What is the link, the weak link with VRF? Um, I'm gonna go back to, I'll let JS answer this after me. I'm gonna go back to the piping system. A, the components of a VRF system are meant to last the life of the system. I mean, it's soft start compressor, soft start fan motors. Um, Yes, on the electronic side, large power surges um, that aren't properly protected against the system could cause issues with the electronics of the system. But 
I, I find that's fairly rare. Um, the weak part of these systems is typically stuff that's done in the field. So it's, was the pipe in properly pressure tested and evacuated? Was it, was it installed correctly? Um, I don't know, how would you answer that, JS? Yeah, that, that's bang on. Uh, any majority of any issues we have out there would be on the installation side. Uh, the, what I'll add to it, because everything you said was correct, what I'll add to it is on the controls and programming as these systems advance and get smarter and smarter, there's more and more options and programmability on these. Uh, Greg mentioned the cruise control set up. Well, now this cruise control is highly programmable. What kind of cruise control? Do you want to prioritize the reaction time or the efficiency? Will you compromise some reaction time for efficiency? And all these things. And these heat recovery systems allow you to heat and cool simultaneously. We've seen jobs where you have two cassettes 15 feet apart and they're not programmed together. So one's cooling while one's heating. They're doing it efficiently, but they're doing it all year long. So things get fighting. So that is often one of the weak points. If ever we hear of a DRF system that an owner thinks is pulling more power than expected, uh, we'll look at the install, how it's operating, but we'll look at the programming uh, of the different features and functions for sure. And a question just came up saying where to locate a reliable designer installer. There's a few resources. Um, recommendations from, from people who have these systems is probably always the best. Uh, manufacturers do list people who have gone through training. I'd recommend people who have gone through training recently as, this, as the systems change a lot. Um, there are some organizations such as MassCEC does have an approved contractor list from when they had the VRF incentive program is a good resource. Um, and I think tomorrow we're gonna to talk a little bit about how to interview a designer installer to see if they're familiar with these systems, have they gone through training, um, all that stuff, which is great. Somebody just typed uh, calculations for energy efficiency of older furnaces as backup units versus mini splits. I mean, that's a complicated topic, but if you have anything to say about it. I'll give a general response. Um, to whoever did that, I know our contact info is, I'm sure we could answer it more detailed through email, but basically what you have to look at is that older furnace that you have, um, what is the COP and be realistic as far as the COP with duct loss and an inefficient, not maintained system. Um, and you basically come up with, I prefer to do it in a B2 per dollar scenario. So burning natural gas with a certain efficiency boiler, what are you paying for each BTU? How many BTUs do you get for a dollar? and then look at a heat pump, um, which is gonna have a much different curve. It's not gonna be fixed because outdoor temperature drops, the COP drops. So you can actually come up with, for your climate, a crossover point of where is that furnace more expensive and where is the heat pump more, more efficient. So typically, if I were just to be very, um, very broad with this, is in Boston, typically a 95% natu natural gas piece of equipment is probably gonna be more efficient more cost effective below 20 degrees and a heat pump is better above 20 degrees. But then the big thing you have to look at is area under the curve. So if you're only spending 50 or 60 hours below 20 degrees, is it worth the extra cost of that system when you spend so much more time above that temperature where you're going to make up so much more energy efficiency than you were on the other end. So it really depends on what you have, but there are some there's ways to look at it back of the napkin. There's some Excel simulations all the way up to a full energy model. and kind of give you different, different layers of accuracy answering that question. Yeah, well, well said, Greg. I would, uh, I would also say that in the New England area, the models for different buildings between some sort of high efficiency furnace and VRF air source heat pumps over the winter tends to be a wash. Air source heat pumps win a little bit. This is just looking at operational cost only. As time goes forward, obviously it depends on our crystal balls on estimating natural gas prices of electricity, but air source heat pumps should become more, even more cost competitive on the operational cost side. The other angle too is in the summer, this equipment tends to be more efficient. So you have some operational cost winnings there over the, the summertime. Some people uh, would like to still keep natural gas. So there are, ways of using both as well and sort of optimizing like greg was saying when it is below 20f let's use a furnace when it's above 20s let's use the, the air source heat pumps there's options there 
those are popular farther and farther north uh, as well as there are more hours below uh, those temperatures. Welcome back to the second part of our two-part workshop. Yesterday we got an introduction to heat pump technology and the different types of heat pumps as well as the variety of equipment options. Today, we will hear more from Greg and JS about how to identify potential applications for heat pumps. And then we'll hear about grant and incentive programs that can support installation of heat pumps in Massachusetts cities and towns. And finally, we'll hear from the town of Lexington about their extensive experience with heat pumps. Now I'll pass it over to JS Rancourt. Most of these slides are entitled identifying heat pump applications. So we're gonna get a little bit into the application to different buildings. So on this first slide, we're talking about air source heat pump versus water source heat pump. So we introduced the technology yesterday and the differences between the two. Now, what we are talking about here is we often talk about higher efficiency buildings and going towards net zero buildings and all electric buildings without any gas, really in, the, in those cases, we're comparing an air source heat pump with a geothermal water source heat pump system, also known as ground source heat pump system. That's the only way to make a water source heat pump or almost the only way to make it all electric and not need a boiler is to uh, have the water go through the ground or through a, a body of, of water. So in regular applications where buildings are not chasing efficiency and not looking to remove gas, then you can still compare air source heat pumps to water source heat pumps. And a lot of the decision and this discussions are around the capital cost differences, compressors not being in the water source heat pump in the suites, but up on the roof, so on and so forth. But when it comes to trying to go uh, all electric, which is what this slide refers to, uh, one of the first things to look at is is there any existing infrastructure, if it's a retrofit building, in that building? Is there an existing water source heat pump loop where the pipes can be reused that can then be converted to geothermal? Uh, in those cases, it makes a lot of sense to go look at the water source heat pump and the ground source heat pump because a lot of that, some of that infrastructure cost is right there. If there is no infrastructure, it's just bricks and mortar or a greenfield uh, new build, um, then a lot of people going looking to go all electric will often try to compare air source versus ground source and generally the air source heat pump is going to be your lower capital cost up front there's much less infrastructure condensers outdoors indoor units inside the building whereas the ground source heat pump needs the, the hydronic infrastructure all the water and then the loops in the ground uh, or uh, in a body of water that tends to be higher capital costs. There are companies out there that fund and finance that portion in the ground source heat pump world, but that's usually what it is. Now your, your ground source heat pump, water source heat pump system can generally be lower operating cost than your air source heat pump. And it depends what you use for a water source heat pump. If you're using regular water source heat pump with simple on off compressors throughout the building, um, you've got a great geothermal loop, but with those heat pumps, uh, you're probably not even gonna beat the operational cost of an air source heat pump, depending what you're using. But don't forget that there's also a uh, water source VRF that can be used that kind of combines the two. So in terms of retrofit applications, a forced air system, which is usually a machine that'll move air, whether it's a vertical air handler, horizontal uh, air handler, and you're looking to go with heat pumps, then you would look at the water to air heat pumps, those are your water source heat pump system that, like I just uh, referred to. Those are still forced air systems. At some point in the ceiling or in the closet, you get a machine that moves the air and heats and, and cools the air. The air to air systems, which is the air source heat pumps, are also forced air systems. Obviously with those, you can get into the, into the ductless world of wall mounts or cassettes. So it's still moving air around, um, but it's, uh, but it is an air source heat pump. On the hydronic side, which essentially means you're moving water around the building, whether it's through radiators or even they can be put through uh, fan coils. Then we get into the other types of systems we talked about yesterday. The water to water systems is usually uh, a 
sort of heat pump chiller that'll connect to a geothermal loop and then it'll generate hot and cold water for the building. Uh, some large uh, net zero schools are using that technology. And an air to water system is essentially an air source heat pump that'll generate hot and cold water directly from the air for the building. So it does depend on how you're planning to distribute your heating and cooling throughout the building, whether you do want forced air, whether you do want radiators, because maybe it's an old building with a lot of glass heat loss. And no matter what you do, you're looking to have hot water near the perimeter. Those are some of the things uh, to look at. Greg, I'll let you uh, finish on, uh, continue in, on this one and then uh, go to yeah. the next. I think the only other thing I'd add to this list here is I know a question came up uh, in our Q&A that folks are interested in how to install these solutions in uh, historic buildings or buildings in a historic district. And that's where this last point here, if your existing distribution is steam or something with no other ductwork is, um, when you use a refrigerant-based system, so you're using a VRF system or mini splits, the benefit you have there often is that you're using much smaller refrigerant line sets, whether it's flexible copper or just smaller diameter refrigerant tubing with um, refrigerant piping with insulation on it, will be smaller than ductwork and water piping. Um, that allows you a lot of flexibility to work around existing architecture um, or existing piping chases that might exist with the steam. And then of course you choose from your 10 or 13 different types of indoor units options that are available to fit your specific space. Um, so in a retrofit application, that's often what we're seeing is just what is the least intrusive thing that can be put in and still provide an efficient system. And that's some place where VRF and mini foot systems really give an advantage. One of the next biggest things that we, we looked at with a heat pump application when you're considering these system types are zoning. Um, do you have, we're going to go back one here, is do you have the need for individual heating and cooling zones? Um, as we talked about yesterday, if you're just trying to do a, um, a large big box store like a Home Depot would not be your best use for uh, a zoning system like VRF. But if you have the need for individual zones, um, that's when these systems start to really make sense. Then we want to take this one step further and say, do you have any need for these different zones to be either owned or metered separately? So for example, if you're building a condo building or an apartment building, um, do you need a meter electricity separately? Do you plan on having the tenants pay for their own or do you plan on covering that entire bill or using something like an energy allocation system? Um, a more common scenario we have is just is a building being built with the future, it might be turned into condominiums, in which case you'd often use individual mini splits, um, individual mini splits so that you're, um, you have the ability in the future that someone can be can buy a part of the building and it can be completely owned. And I'm talking residential here, but that can also be office condos. Um, so if you have a municipal building that might be used in the future as office condos, having individual separate systems per uh, area might make sense there. Uh, and then the last topic there is when considering any type of heat pump, um, always review efficiency opportunities in the building envelope before sizing an HVAC system. Um, with heat pumps, they operate most efficiently when they are properly sized um, to meet the heat and load when they're not grossly oversized. Um, what that often means is you can save on equipment costs by buying smaller equipment, you're going to buy less equipment, you're going to use less energy by doing some of the low hanging fruit such as insulation and windows, um, improved windows are all things that are going to a, a heat pump operate both more efficient and more comfortable because it's not just a blast of heat from a boiler system. Um, it is delivered in different ways with ductless units and ducted units that these uh, efficiency opportunities are often best done at the same time. Greg, if you don't mind going back, I'd like to add something to, to this slide. With regular HVAC systems that we're all used to, whether it's residential or commercial, usually the cooling and the heating systems are two separate things. The cooling is a condenser 
a package DX unit or something and the heating is a boiler or a furnace. And in that world, the cooling equipment costs a lot more than the heating equipment on a ton per ton basis. Uh, that three ton condensing unit is gonna cost you more than the equivalent three ton furnace. Same thing applies commercially. So historically when people and engineers calculate how much heating you need or when design build contractors design systems, there's not a huge capital cost penalty in, in providing larger heating equipment, larger boilers, larger furnaces. There historically hasn't been a huge penalty and it's, it's an easy safety to just oversize the heating and not spend too much time trying to determine the heat loss. When it comes to a heat pump, the heating and cooling is combined. So we have to size the system for the worst of the two, cooling or heating. For most new buildings, it's cooling that leads the way. For older buildings, it's heating that, that, that's dominant. What that means is there now is a cost penalty in ignoring the heat loss or the envelope and then just throwing a bunch of safety factors on the heating side because now you're buying more tonnage of heating and cooling. You're not just buying a slightly larger burner. So that's a, a barrier for air source heat pumps that's getting better as engineers properly looking at the heat loss and not just putting too many factors uh, on it. And then when people do look at better envelopes, you know, net zero, there's something called net zero positive. You know, there's a cost to making envelope better, but there are savings elsewhere. And here, because an air source heat pump, the heating and the cooling is the same equipment, as you tighten up your building, you can start to really reduce the amount of air source heat pump tonnage that you're purchasing. So there's a gain there, other than the operation of the building, there's a gain in, in, in improving the envelope because you will, you should be able to purchase less uh, equipment. Great, thanks for adding that. Um, before we move on to a, a one more slide about how to, um, how to pick a designer or a contractor. I do wonder, there was a follow-up on our question and answer about um, restrictions of a historic district. I talked internal, I didn't talk external to the visible portion of these systems. And that is a big point in why VRF would be used over mini splits or vice versa. Um, VRF gives you the benefit that you have extremely long line lengths. I mean, you can have hundreds and thousands of feet depending on your system to hide your condensing unit somewhere out of the way. I mean, I've done some historic buildings where we bury refrigerant lines set 400 feet from the building. On that theme though, keep in mind that now that mini splits, the technology has really come up to par with VRF systems as far as capability, it may be your solution is you need to hide a large central unit on the roof and having several smaller mini split systems that are more easily hidden from view or aren't quite as tall or are scattered around the building to be hidden behind certain features uh, may be your option to um, serve your whole building with a heat pump um, and meet historic requirements. So I'd say overall my advice would be look at everything you have in front of you to meet your requirements. A central system, mini split systems, or maybe some combination of the two that help you accomplish what you need to, for instance, hide in units at a historic district. Um, the next big question is, or the next big thing is, how do you choose the right people to get involved with on a project? Um, it could be design build where a contractor is gonna do all your design and installation, or you could be working with a mechanical engineer who's gonna design the system and then bid it out. Um, there are just some, here's a few recommended questions that we think that should be asked to choose the right people for this, uh, for your project. Um, Ask auditors if they will consider heat pumps as well as upgrades of existing fossil fuel equipment. Well, I think we've touched on this quite a bit is, although an alternate source of heat isn't needed in your building, um, it may make sense to keep your fossil fuel equipment and then make sure that anyone that's audited and are looking at your building is looking at, is it worth, even though what you have is there, is it worth upgrading to a heat pump and taking advantage of some of these rebate programs and incentive programs um, often might be price comparable with just refurbishing or using your existing equipment that's there. Um, ask why the proposed technology is a good fit for your building. I hope we've gotten across that there's no one size fits all solution. Um, so make sure that they understand why a heat pump is or is not being used. Um, 
has the proposed equipment been properly sized for my building? This is not the equipment of decades ago where you can say, um, stand across the street and based on how big the building looks, decide how many BTUs you're gonna put in. Was a heat loss calculation done? Is it the right sized equipment? Uh, you can have the best intent of using a VRF system to be efficient in your building. And if it's grossly oversized, it is not gonna be comfortable. It's not gonna be efficient. Um, and down the line, operation-wise, you're just not going to be happy with it. it. It all starts with having a properly sized piece of equipment. Um, how do installation and operating costs compare to the alternatives? Make sure you're, you're not just looking at comparing EER numbers or COP numbers that we went through yesterday, but do a true apples for apples comparison of, of operating costs, install costs, um, and make sure you're, you're taking fuel switching into account and different technology types into account because typically you may see that a VRF system could be more expensive to install, but it might greatly save you on operation costs uh, over the life of the system that can help pay that back fairly quickly. Probably one of the most important ones I think is, has the designer, contractor, installer, whoever you're working with, is have they completed manufacturer training on the chosen equipment? Um, this is, is a leapfrog industry as far as every year, new, new technology, new models come out. Um, for whatever manufacturer you're looking at or your contractor's looking at is, are they up to date with the manufacturer's required training so that one, they know what they're doing when they install it, but even when they're recommending it or designing it for you is, are they familiar up with equipment to make sure that they're helping you make the right choice? Um, we see quite a bit a contractor will be asked, or used to, not so much anymore, but a contractor will be asked is, does a heat pump work for my building? And they might respond with, no, we don't think that, um, we don't think a heat pump can heat in this area because they haven't been up to date on training for the past 10 years to know about all the new capabilities of equipment. Um, so that ties in close with this last one here of when you're working with a contractor is, what other installations have they had of similar scope are they familiar with this equipment? Have they done it before? Are they, can they handle a building of your size with this type of equipment? Um, I know JS can probably agree. We see a lot of contractors who do very large scale heat pump installations. Almost, some of them almost do it as their main specialty. Um, those are the types of people you want involved on your systems, not someone who uh, has never done a heat pump before because they might not be able to give you a good recommendation on how it fits into your building. Anything to add there, JS? Just, just one thing that was great in the last parts about the installing contractor. One of the reasons why air source heat pumps have become so popular <clears throat> recently is because of the pricing of them that has both the equipment and the installation. But that's where things can differ a lot from contractor A to contractor B. So Greg's last comment there about a contractor who's done this before similar scope is not only important for the install, but for the pricing exercise. We've seen owners looking at an air source heat pump <clears throat> compared to something else, and the, uh, the, you know, sometimes the VRF pricing can come in, or the mini <clears throat> even the mini split install, but usually the VRF pricing can come in uh, a lot higher than what it should be, and it might just be an experience thing or a fear thing from some contractors that may not have done a VRF job of that size. So it does affect your pricing a lot. So we recommend choosing the right contractor early with some experience for the proper pricing. Agreed completely. And some great resources to find that are um, obviously references from anyone that has a similar project to you or colleagues that you may have. But if you're looking someplace to start just from the beginning, uh, most manufacturer websites will list contractors who've completed training or a minimum amount of training, as well as a schedule of upcoming training. So. If you have a few brands you're looking at, find out from them what contractors are up to date on their training that are in your area or that you may already work with. That's one of my preferences is for a facility is find out what contractors they already have a relationship with and kind of cross-reference that with who has gone through recent training. And it may be someone you already have a relationship with is up to date on this equipment, or you can get a new contact from these training lists. Um, and everyone is constantly holding training. So if you have someone that you do specifically want to work with, there's training going on on every month. There's training out there where people can get educated on this equipment before helping you with your project. Um, 
Another great resource that's out there specifically very local to us is the MassCEC has a designer and installer list. Um, at one point, the MassCEC had an a incredible rebate for, or incredible incentive for beer up equipment, which required contractors and designers to prove they were trained for a project to be eligible. So that list is still available online and is a great, um, a great list that great list that shows who recently and proactively signed up for training to be a part of that program at that time. Um, and some of the more common installers and designers are on that list. Before I turn it over to Lauren real quick, a simple question came in on can the customer attend training? Um, yes, there are a variety of different trainings. There are installation trainings, service trainings, um, sales trainings, application trainings. Uh, there, there is no requirement of who um, of being a contractor to go to a training. It is common for us to have seen larger universities will have sent their facility staff to the install and service training so they're familiar with equipment. Um, reach out to I mean, myself, JF, uh, whoever you're working with, as far as what training would be appropriate for uh, yourself if you're interested in learning more. There's a variety of different things and we can match stuff up that fits what you're doing best. Um, from here, I will turn it over to Lauren and let her continue on from here, but we will still be around for questions after this. Okay, thanks. So now we're going to hear about um, grant and incentive programs in Massachusetts that will support installation of heat pumps in municipal or other types of facilities. First, we're going to hear from Shante Davidson, who is an energy efficiency consultant at Eversource. Thank you for having us um, today. My name is Shante Davidson. Like Lauren said, I'm going to be representing MassSave today. We are going to discuss what incentive programs we have to help you take advantage of heat pump or BRF installation. We'll be focusing on the mini, uh, excuse me, on the muni program, but we'll also talk about a couple of alternatives, which include our new construction program and our option program. We will discuss who is eligible, how the program is funded, and the pathways to participation, and a few benefits. Next slide, please. Alrighty, so this program is brought to you by four specific program sponsors, including Cape Light Compact, Eversource, National Grid, and Unitil. That's because we are the only program sponsors in the state of Massachusetts that provide electricity. So depending on who um, provides your electric service, that's going to be the program sponsor that you're going to work with when you do decide to um, upgrade to heat pumps or VRFs. To determine the eligibility for your incentives, um, referencing the programs that I'm going to speak to and the specific processes, we have provided the direct contacts for you. So I'm going to be speaking about the programs in generally and how they work, but certainly want to encourage you to reach out to your respective um, program sponsor early into the project so that you can um, secure those incentives as soon as possible. One of the main questions we get is, uh, is who is eligible? And when it comes down to, you know, a CNI versus a residential incentive, it's really gonna map back to that commercial meter. So as long as your facility is on a commercial meter, you'll be able to take advantage of any of the CNI or commercial and industrial um, incentive programs that we have. One of the most common questions we get is, you know, I have a small building or I only have one room that I need to heat or cool and it's going to be residentially sized equipment. That's okay. Residentially sized equipment does qualify for the program and it would qualify at a commercial rate because again, it's mapping back to the meter that you're actually going to be um, paying for usage off of. Uh, a lot of questions we get is how does the program work? Um, if you look at the back of your bill, it's usually the last page. Um, I know for my specific residential Eversource bill, if I look at the back, there's a title that, uh, there's a column rather, that's titled Total Charges for Electricity. And there's a specific line item that states how much you're paying in um, for energy efficiency. So we follow, um, most of the program sponsors follow that same format on our bills. So just go ahead, um, turn to the last page, look at that energy efficiency line item, and you'll see that you're paying into this fund. You know, one of our responsibilities is to be good stewards and to, and to make sure that we are allowing all of our respective customers to participate. So definitely want to encourage you all to participate in this program now or in the future because quite frankly, you're paying into it. So uh, 
but certainly hope you guys will all participate. Alrighty, so this is really where all the action happens. So as you can imagine, we have a diverse set of customers. Some of you are probably residential customers, and, um, and then obviously with the jobs that you have, you're a municipal customer. Since we do have such diverse customers, we have a few different pathways that you can access customers through. through. Um, it can be a little bit confusing, so I'm going to try to slow down and take it um, step by step. As we talk about this, there are a couple of things I want you to keep in mind. You can only participate in one pathway. Um, basically meaning we can only pay the incentive out to you one time. So earlier when I said uh, contact your program sponsor early, please make sure you do that. That way you can ensure that you know which um, program you're participating in so we don't have any discrepancies about participating in more than one program um, at a time. Now as a Muni customer, the Muni program, whether you participate in it as a standard customer or whether you're in a part of the green communities, you will be served by the Muni program. The Muni program focuses on cities, towns, counties, and states governments. <clears throat> Just by way of a little background, in terms of green communities, about one third of all cities and towns in the state of Massachusetts have applied for and become a green community. Um, just as a reminder, you must apply and be enrolled in the community program. Um, and once you once you hit your reduction and it's achieved, that is the point that you receive your green community designation. Alrighty, so typically, what happens in a calendar year is you would <clears throat> submit an application that would be due in March due to COVID nineteen. Right now, we've extended the. Um, deadline to May 1st. And so you would you would submit an, a custom application to us and we would be able to announce uh, whether or not you would be awarded the incentive typically by about July. Um, we wanna make sure that it supports the cities and towns budgeting cycle. Um, and we would have we would ask for you guys to install these <clears throat> this equipment within six months. Um, so now is really the time to start thinking about what applications you want to submit for next year um, or even presumably the end of the year because it does take um, a little bit to, of time to put a good application together. Um, so as long as you're a Muni, you basically submit the application. It's a turnkey program, meaning that let's say you've decided you want to upgrade uh, to heat pumps or VRFs in a certain facility, you're going to reach out to one of the contacts that we provide at the end of this um, presentation. They're going to basically assign an auditor to you that's going to go through um, the facility soup to nuts. They're going to help you complete the application. They're going to evaluate that um, project. They're going to submit it to the utility or program sponsor on your behalf to determine what the savings are. And at that point, we will provide you um, a letter of intent with what we expect the incentives to be. Once the project is installed, that's when we would basically provide the incentive dollars. And then we all have specific um, inspection requirements. So that's how the application works. You reach out to us. You're, um, you're assigned a specific turnkey provider. That person is going to audit your facility and help you with everything soup to nuts. One of the questions we get is, you know, I don't think my auditor was comprehensive enough or, you know, I want to look like a second opinion. If that's the case, simply reach out to us. We want to make sure that you have a proposal that meets your needs. So again, you reach out to us. We have your facility audited. You start that application it gets submitted to the specific program sponsor so we can evaluate it, confirm the savings, um, and then provide an incentive letter. Again, after the product is installed, then we would pay the incentive out and then you would have the inspection. So that's how it's gonna work for, for you as a Muni, whether or not you're part of green communities or whether you're, or, or even if you're not. Now, an alternative to these programs that exist are the upstream program and the new construction program. The upstream program is basically an open program, so there's not a set um, turnkey vendor that you would um, participate with. It's whomever you choose. Um, and you would basically get discounted pricing on the equipment at, at point of sale. So your facilities um, person would walk into the brick and mortar location, 
get whatever you need or you would have your contractor do it. And then on the invoice, when you actually pay for that transaction, that's when you would see um, the price differential. And in terms of new construction, it's really ideal for um, ground up construction or major renovations with longer timelines. Uh, we do take a whole buildings approach. And so we would really wanna make sure that we are um, socializing with you at the onset of a project so that we have the time that we need to investigate um, options to help mitigate some costs and to look for opportunities to increase savings. Typically, whenever we're working on a new construction project, our target is to make sure we can save 10% um, over code. A uh, couple things regarding all of the pathways. Um, we're, again, we, we only pay one incentive, so make sure you only participate in one program. And then a lot of times we get questions about which equipment qualifies. And as long, the equipment basically is gonna have to meet certain energy efficiency requirements. But again, by working with your local program sponsor, um, they'll be able to let you know what qualifies. All right here. Alrighty, so how do you get started? So again, we'll provide the contacts for you. You're going to want to reach out to your respective program sponsor. They will assign you with your turnkey vendor who will do the auditing because they are contracted with us. So they'll come out to your facility, they'll do a turnkey audit. Um, at that point, they'll provide you with some cost estimates and they'll present a proposal for you. Um, and then the work will get started if you decide to move with the proposal. Again, you always have the option to get a second opinion if you feel like you're not getting the scope that you requested um, or if you, um, your needs aren't being met for some other reason. We've also gotten quick um, questions about what equipment has to be used um, from like a, a manufacturing standpoint. So we do remain agnostic as program sponsors. So you really want to make sure that you consult with whomever is helping you get this project off the ground to make sure you're getting the best uh, equipment to meet your needs. Um, a couple other things about the option and new construction programs that are worth mentioning. The upstream program is really meant as an end of life program. Um, so if you have um, a piece of equipment that's just exceeded its life, you're really going, going to want to um, consider the upstream program. It's um, equipment replacement um, versus early replacement. So early replacement for example, is when it's, uh, the equipment is not running or it's less than 15 years old. We can certainly provide an incentive for that in the Muni program, but when, they, when the equipment is basically dead or dying, that's really when you're going to want to consider using either the upstream program or even um, the new construction program. And then if it is a new ground up um, construction or if you're um, doing a gut rehab for an existing building, when you reach out to us, um, to start socializing this idea. The new construction team would work with um, the building team to have a des design charrette, just so that we can understand um, what the building, how the building is going to behave once it's reconstructed. Alrighty. And then some of the program um, benefits include making the equipment available to customers for energy savings. So by providing these incentives, we, um, we're helping to prop up better equipment being used in our local territory and then uh, reducing carbon emissions. And finally, um, we recognize that there are a few barriers that municipalities face when trying to get new products off the ground. And so we look to be able to provide you some resources to overcome some of those systemic barriers. And then lastly, what you will see is um, our list of contacts. So earlier to earlier um, I mentioned that there are four specific electric program sponsors um, and so this is all of our contact information. You will notice that Aerosource and um, National Grid specifically um, basically carve out by territory um, but rest assured if you reach out to anyone on that list and provide your address we'll be able to um, direct you to the person that can best serve your needs. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, we certainly hope that you will consider participating in our programs in the future. Thanks, Shante. Um, I, a couple things that came in in the Q&A. Margaret Song, who works at Cape Light Compact, as you can see here on the slide, um, noted that for Cape and Vineyard municipalities, they will accept applications for heat pump custom applications at any time. So that's a little bit different than, than um, the other parts of the state that Shante mentioned. Um, 
And you know what? Can I actually build yes and that? So she's totally right. I apologize. We'll technically take applications anytime. It's just that for the Green Communities Program, we take them usually every March. We've just extended it to May for this current calendar year. But in order to um, qualify for the Green Communities with receiving the incentive of a uh, GAP grant of up to 100,000, um, that, that application cycle, um, the application is due every March. And now we're going to hear from Samantha Meserve, who is the Deputy Director of the Renewable Energy Division at the Mass Department of Energy Resources. Thanks, Lauren. Um, like Lauren mentioned, my name is Samantha Meserve. I'm the Deputy Director of the Renewable and Alternative Energy Division at the Massachusetts DOER. And today I'm gonna to be talking about heat pumps in our APS program. Okay, and Lauren, do I have, okay. Um, so some background on the APS. The APS was originally established as part of the Green Communities Act of 2008, uh, and it had historically just incentivized technologies such as combined heat and power and flywheel storage. However, in 2014, the legislature passed an act to allow a whole suite of renewable thermal technologies, including air and ground source heat pumps, to be eligible under the program. So in 2016, we began working on a rulemaking to add those technologies in. While we were in the midst of that rulemaking, the legislature passed um, another act, which allowed waste energy, thermal and fuel cells to also be included as eligible technologies. So we um, basically restarted the rulemaking process, included those technologies, and then closed that out around 20, the end of 2017 and began accepting applications um, very early 2018 for these renewable thermal technologies. Um, for those of you that are familiar with a portfolio standard, um, a, a certificate um, is usually equivalent to a megawatt hour of electricity. And so it, under the APS, where we're working um, more typically with heat, um, it's equivalent to 3,412,000 BTUs of what we term useful thermal energy. So just to give you all um, an example uh, of what the APS is, so um, the, the state and DOER are requires that all load serving entities in Massachusetts have a certain percentage of their energy that comes from alternative energy sources. Um, and load, load serving entities apply to not only your investor owned utilities, but also retail electricity suppliers. I believe right now in the state, there's around 65 to 70 of those entities. Um, and so each year they have a certain percentage of their load that they're required to procure from alternative energy sources. Um, and so in order to do that, the department qualifies generation units, which then produce certificates that those load serving entities then are able to go out and purchase in order to meet their compliance. Um, so you can just see here an example, if a utility had a million megawatt hours of load in 2020, and they had an obligation to procure four and a quarter percent, um, they would need to purchase around 42,000 um, certificates in order to meet that obligation. The, the APS is a market program, and so um, the market is really what is determining the certificate price and therefore the overall incentive that generation unit owners will receive. And um, there are two variables that do help influence that price. Um, the first being the minimum standard, and that is the demand for certificates. And so this is what is set by DOER, and that's that percentage from the earlier slide that I had mentioned. Um, and so for you can see how this um, affects certificate prices um, with an example from a few years ago, um, 2015, the APS program was very undersupplied. There was only about 50% of certificates in the market um, that were needed to meet compliance. And because of that, generation unit and certificate owners were able to charge more for their certificates because there was a shortage in the market. Um, and so they, they were able to get a, a pretty decent price at that time. The other variable that affects price is the alternative compliance payment. Um, in the case where someone that has an obligation is not able to get a certificate, they are have the option to pay a flat fee, this alternative compliance payment, in order to satisfy their obligation. Um, and so this is exactly 
exactly for like the case I mentioned in 2015. There just weren't enough certificates in the market for everyone to meet their compliance. And so instead of penalizing uh, load serving entities for not being able to procure enough certificates simply because there were not enough, um, they always have the option to pay this flat fee. And this really acts as a ceiling on certificate prices because let's say your ACP, for example, was $22. No one's gonna pay more than $22 for a certificate um, because at any time they could always just choose to play that, pay that flat fee and, and meet their compliance. Um, and so again, back to that example from 2015 where we saw that the market was very undersupplied and prices were pretty high, they actually were right up against that ACP rate. So I think at the time the ACP CP rate was around $22 and we saw certificates trading at around $20, $21. So you can see it's, it's very close. Um, currently we, um, don't have a, an undersupply where we have um, a bit of an oversupply. And so we've seen certificate prices trend downwards um, because as you would expect in a market, um, now those that are seeking to purchase certificates have a little bit more, um, power in their negotiation because of that oversupply. Um, okay, and then I think we can move on to the next slide. Um, so just to kind of explain who are the program participants um, and, and the names that we give to them. So generation unit owners, this would be system owners. So either the, the town or the city um, and the, or you know the, the individual, whoever um, owns that system. Um, and then you have installers and manufacturers. Um, we like to work with them as closely as possible so that they understand the program um, and that they're either installing systems that meet our requirements or um, are able to design their systems or software to help meet our requirements. An authorized representative is just someone who works on behalf of a system owner. Um, so a lot of times you'll have these third party entities that recognize a city or a town or a company might not understand how this program works and the necessary steps that need to be taken in order to qualify. And so these authorized representatives um, offer a service and that they'll help in the, the pre-construction phase, make sure your system's eligible, they'll work with you during construction, they'll um, do all of that kind of legwork for you in order to make the process smooth. Um, an independent verifier is a third party that verifies the production of systems. Um, so in a majority of cases, um, the Mass Clean Energy Center will serve for this role, um, but for some larger systems, um, it might be required that you find your own independent and contract with your own independent verifier. Um, oftentimes, that's just an engineering firm um, that can fill that role. Um, and then lastly, aggregators. An aggregator is someone that will sell your certificates for you. So the load serving entities that are participating in this program have to buy tens of thousands of certificates. And so for them, there's a big administrative burden to try and contract with every individual generation unit owner. And so what an aggregator does is they come in and aggregate all of their clients. They a broker that contract with the load serving entity and then they take a small percentage fee from the sale of certificates um, and then they distribute the rest to their clients. We really encourage people to work with aggregators. Um, it's not required. We do have people that do it on their own, but we tend to see the people that do it on their own get less of an incentive just because they're not as in tune with the market and where certificate prices are falling at that point in time. Um, and so in order to make sure you're not leaving anything on the table, we do encourage you to work with an aggregator. Um, we provide a list on our website um, if anyone is interested in, in who those entities might be. And we can go on to the next slide. So um, I know that this is a lot of text and, and I'm sure some of you that might have um, be familiar with the APS program know it's, it's very complicated. So I'm just gonna give a very high level overview to this program. Um, and then um, if anyone has questions or anything like that, feel free to either put them in the chat or reach out to me directly. So the APS program works on um, a framework that identifies or classifies systems into three different categories, small, intermediate, and large. Um, and this is based on their system capacity and it dictates how they receive their certificates and um, the requirements in order for them to be eligible within the program. So I believe if you go to the next slide, um, it'll highlight 
um, air source and ground source heat pumps, you can see they have the same um, breakout for small, intermediate, and large. For small, it's anything less than 134,000 BTUs per hour. Uh, it's about 11 or 12 tons. Um, and that is for any facility type. So that is if you are a apartment, a home, a small office space, a small storefront, um, it, we don't, um, have program rules based on your facility type. It's all just based on your system size. And then if you are an intermediate, you're between 134,000 and a million BTUs per hour. And then anything greater than a million BTUs per hour would be considered a large system. And then for uh, all of our technologies, we're also able to provide multipliers. And these are directly tied to that size classification from the previous slide. So the multipliers is a number that is applied to the number of certificates that your system generates. And this was based on the fact that um, the EPS, the certificate prices were, were pretty low when the program was being established. And we just recognized that on its own, the, that amount of incentive probably wasn't gonna drive the adoption of any technologies. And so what we did is we looked at what we thought would be necessary to drive these, uh, systems forward and then we provided a multiplier in order to get what the incentive based on production would be closer to what that necessary value is. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, again, um, it'll just be highlighted for ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Um, so for ground source heat pumps, you would receive a multiplier of five. So um, if your system produced a uh, hundred megawatt hour equivalents of thermal energy, um, you would get 500 certificates. Um, and then the same thing for air source, um, they have a multiplier of three. You will note um, in the line above the air source line, um, for small air source heat pumps, if you are retaining your backup system, um, you will receive a slightly lower uh, multiplier. Um, we really are, are trying to push people into doing that whole facility solution. Um, and so it's, it's slightly more lucrative if you um, remove that backup system and go full, uh, full capacity air source heat pump. Um, and then additionally, we also provide um, an extra multiplier for heat pumps um, if there is uh, energy efficiency put in place. So um, if it's a residential system, if you receive a HERS rating of 50 or less, or if you're able to meet um, the definition of zero energy or passive house, um, you receive an extra multiplier of two, and that would be added to the multiplier from the previous slide. So for example, if you are a ground source heat pump and you had a multiplier of five, but you meet the definition of passive house and you're able to document that, you would actually receive a multiplier of seven. So it's added to the multiplier from the previous slide. I will note, um, we do follow the Department of Energy's definition of zero net energy. Um, in that definition, you, if you have on-site renewables, you are required to retain any sort of rec associated with that. So um, if you, for example, had a, a small office building or a field office and you had solar on the roof and then you installed air source heat pumps, um, if you are selling the RECs or SRECs associated with that solar system, um, you would not meet the definition of zero energy. Um, so just to help clarify that for people, because I know that's um, for some towns has, has been kind of a sticking point. So for small generation units, um, we actually do not require any metering. Um, and this is because thermal metering is very complicated and it's very expensive. And so for these small systems, um, we felt that requiring metering would really negate any benefit of the incentive. And so in replacement of that, we established formulas, which we crafted based on Massachusetts residential energy consumption data. And we looked at, um, you know, what is the, the heating demand for various types of buildings, um, residential and, and small commercial. And we determined um, what the heating demand over a year would be. And we um, deduced that if your heat pump system was providing 100% of your heating load, then realistically your system would be producing equivalent to that demand. Um, and that's how we crafted this formula and it's based off of the square footage of your facility. 
So for example, you can see um, for an air source heat pump, if you are 1500 square feet or less, um, you're gonna get three aches. Um, and that would be pre-multiplier um, and is just, you would get three. Um, for ground source heat pumps, it's 4.6. Um, and then as you increase, um, we do it in 100 square foot increments. So 1500, 1600, 1700 and so on. Um, you would use the formula below um, in order to calculate your certificates. We do have a tool that will help you do this online. Um, the link is here um, and I can, it's also just on our general website um, and you're able to put in some simple information um, and there's actually the ability to move the ache price up and down if you wanna play with, well, if certificates are in a great place and trading higher, what would my incentive be? If my certificates are trading lower, what would they be? Um, I will also um, say it's not on the slide, but small generation units are also eligible for what we term pre-minting. Um, and again, this is something that was implemented in order to help this incentive be meaningful towards the, the total cost of the system. Um, again, recognizing that ache prices are uh, lower than some of the other certificate programs that we have. Um, and so you know, an average um, air source heat pump system might receive an incentive that's maybe say $2,000. Um, and so splitting that up over say 40 quarters would result in a really small dollar amount and we felt wouldn't actually help drive systems forward. And so pre-minting allows all of um, these small generation units, all of their certificates to be minted or created in the first quarter that they are eligible. And that's based off of 10 years of production. So if you go to the next slide, this is just an example of what that might look like. So if you are an air source heat pump system and you do not have an energy efficiency adder and your facility is less than 1500 square feet, then you would be receiving that three aches like we saw on the previous slide you would be getting um, a multiplier three, so that would be nine aches per year, and then we would be giving you a 10-year strip, and so that would be 90 aches. Um, and so then you can see for, I just did kind of a, a representative um, suite of different square footages here. Um, and so you can see, obviously, if you're a larger facility and you're doing ground source heat pumps and you have the energy efficiency adder, um, you would be getting, you could get up to 647 aches um, and so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, depending on what the aches were trading at at that point in time, you would use this to get to your final incentive amount. And then the next slide. Um, so this is where things get a little more complicated. So with intermediate and large generation units, um, this follows a more traditional portfolio standard framework where you are required to meter your system. Um, typically for intermediate systems, we're seeing thermal meters and, and electricity meters. Um, Oh, and for large systems, it would be uh, a whole thermal electricity flow sensors and pressure sensors. Um, we are trying to be as flexible as we can with the metering, with the statute written the way it is and our regulations written the way they are. Um, there are certain um, data points that we have to collect and we have to feel confident in those data points. Um, but again, we recognize that the metering for these systems can be very quickly become very expensive and very complicated. And so we try where we can to, um, you know, give uh, exceptions and, and work with system owners. Um, and so something that, you know, we're always willing to do if you have a project that um, you need to put metering in for, um, we're happy to have you come in or send us information about the system, um, review that information, provide feedback before you go to bid or to design um, in order to help, you know, make sure that once the system is built, it, it's ready to go and it's APS compliant. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can just see this is kind of a schematic that we've been working on. Um, just an example of some metering where um, you have an outdoor unit and you have power going into that outdoor unit as well as outside air. Um, and then you have your indoor units, one's in heating, one's in cooling. Um, so these are all just an example of different variables that we might be metering where we could craft a formula in order to get to the, the number of aches that your system should receive. So um, again, it's super, this super high level, but just to give you a little flavor of the certain things that we're looking for as we um, review these intermediate and large generation unit applications. 
and then I think we can go to the next slide. Um, and then here is, is just a suite of, of helpful links, um, our web page, our application portal, and then some of our regulations and guidelines that have to do with um, eligibility criteria and metering. Um, I didn't get too deep into the eligibility criteria here just because um, I only had 10 minutes and frankly, there's a lot of it. <laughs> um, uh, small generation units do tend to have more eligibility criteria because um, we did craft those formulas for calculating aches and when we were crafting those we had to make certain assumptions and so it's necessary to have those criteria in order to ensure that um, the systems are being installed to meet those match those assumptions intermediate and large systems it's really just the metering um, there's not as many eligibility criteria um, but both of the guidelines are, are there and again happy to spend more time um, with anyone that has follow-up questions I'll pass it on to Joanne Bissetta, who is the Deputy Director of the Green Communities Division at Mass Department of Energy Resources. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Joanne Bissetta from the Green Communities Division. And I'm going to uh, talk about um, a little bit of the context regarding uh, the policies and programs that's driving all this effort. And then talk specifically about a couple of initiatives and resources from the Green Communities Division that um, municipalities looking to install uh, heat pumps may find helpful. Next slide, please. So um, again, the little bit of context. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act. That was another piece of legislation that was passed in 2008. And this um, established uh, goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. Next slide, please. And um, we are on our way towards doing that. So this information is based on uh, 2016 energy data. And the pie chart on the left depicts uh, the fact that uh, approximately 40% of the Massachusetts energy footprint, if you will, um, goes towards heating buildings. Um, which is a fairly, you know, substantial amount. And then meanwhile, uh, looking at the line graph in the middle there, uh, a lot of our, our majority of our reductions have come from uh, efficiencies in the electric grid. So this is from co closing the coal-fired power plants, as well as um, folks implementing energy efficiency projects in their buildings. So, you know, paradoxically, with electric generation being our smallest uh, component of energy use, it's made up the bulk of our um, emissions reductions. And um, as you can imagine, through the law of diminishing returns, um, that's gonna get harder and harder to do. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I'm gonna say back in uh, 2018, uh, the governor uh, established Executive Order 569 directing the state to come up with an integrated climate change strategy for the Commonwealth and has multiple components and one of those uh, directed DOER to complete a comprehensive energy plan that would look at um, energy demand going towards the future by um, in the electric transportation and thermal conditioning sectors. Also, it called for um, strategies for meeting this uh, demand moving forward and then prioritizing through uh, conservation, energy efficiency, and other demand reductions, ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So um, this busy slide shows that the comprehensive energy plan looked at several scenarios and lo and behold, the uh, the largest uh, orange block on the right there shows that by combining high electrification through heat pumps, for example, with uh, high renewables, so you know most, more solar and other renewable electric services, combined with aggressive conservation and fuel switching, we will achieve greatest emission reductions. So again, this is sort of the framework that has been driving state policies and programs for the past year or so, and it's sort of trickled down to our Green Communities Program. Next slide, please. So um, now I'm gonna talk about our division and what we do. Um, a lot of folks uh, are familiar with us, but if you're not, 
the Green Communities Division is part of the uh, Department of Energy Resources, and we are sort of the hub of all municipal energy um, information resources tools uh, for the Commonwealth. Um, not just folks that are designated green communities, but all. Next slide, please. So um, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some of the grant programs in a minute. So our hallmark is the designation and grant program. Um, but we also provide a free energy benchmarking and tracking tool called Mass Energy Insight. That's free to any local entity. And we also provide technical assistance grants to local entities. And um, I always plug our website that, have, that has tools and resources, including uh, past webinars that you may find very informative. And if you don't receive our e-blasts by now, um, you should sign up. This is how we communicate um, all our grant offerings, webinars, live meetings, if we ever have them again. Um, and we just do one or two of these a month, so we're not going to jam your inboxes. So I encourage you to sign up if you don't already receive these. Next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, so a little bit about where we're going. Um, as many of you may know, we've been around for about 10 years and we uh, are continuing to add um, green communities to our list. And we're currently actively working on about 20 potential new designations uh, for this coming year. Also this year, we are looking to uh, work with our existing green communities that are part of regional school districts. Um, right now, a lot of them don't include the regional school districts um, for a variety of reasons. And so the portfolio of buildings are not part of the municipal portfolio that we provide funding for. And we're very interested in helping uh, school buildings become more efficient. So we're, we're uh, trying to uh, encourage more activity in that area. We're also uh, working with communities um, underperforming, maybe it's a poor choice of words, but are, they're having challenges in reaching uh, energy reductions. So we're doing some targeted efforts with that. And then lastly, but most importantly, the Strategic Electrification Initiative. Next slide. So this is one of my favorite slides. I'm a very visual person. Um, so what this depicts is obviously the state of Massachusetts and the um, cost of heating fuels. And red and orange means high costs. Light green and dark green means low costs. And coincidentally, that also reflects um, where uh, communities have access to natural gas for heat and where they don't. So. Um, as has been talked about earlier, um, clean heating and cooling technologies will always help reduce emissions, especially as the grid continues to get cleaner. But from a financial standpoint, the biggest wins will come from displacing um, electric resistance heating, heating oil, and propane um, in these buildings. Next slide. So um, one of the resources we have is the Municipal Energy Technical Assistance Grants, better known as META. Um, and these are small grants that allow communities to hire third-party experts to do any kind of um, technical work on their behalf. You know, often municipalities don't have engineers on staff or folks familiar with um, different technologies. So um, these are small grants that um, for communities that are interested in doing feasibility studies for renewable thermal technologies, that's certainly a um, uh, something that can hire an expert to do. We make these uh, um, solicitations annually, and we expect the next one to be out this summer. And these are open to any municipality. You don't have to be a green community to apply for these. Next slide, please. Next, I'm gonna talk about our Green Communities Grant. Um, this is directly uh, in our wheelhouse. We would love to support more renewable thermal uh, projects. And we have two different kinds of Green Communities Grant. One is the designation grant. And this gets awarded to communities once they meet the five Green Communities requirements. Um, we have an annual application, usually later in the year. And these grants are uh, awarded on a formula basis. You can see the formula on your slide. 
and um, what the community would do once they become a green community is they apply to us for projects they'd like us to fund. Um, and certainly we funded um, some of these technologies with designation grants. Once a community has spent down the grant, they're now invited to uh, apply for competitive grants. And these are also available annually and they're up to $200,000 per applicant. And again, these are, you know, we would love to fund more renewable thermal projects. Um, next slide, please. And here's just a picture of what we would fund or we support with the Green Communities Grants. We've been talking about a lot, two of these in particular for the past two days. Next slide. So this is um, sort of a mini case study. You're gonna hear more from the town of Lexington later who go much more in depth, but I just wanted to um, ex explain how uh, our, you know, potentially smaller grants can still help communities. So um, this is from the town of Gill. And with their designation grant in 2015, we funded uh, some mini splits to replace the heating system in their Riverside Municipal Building. Um, the grant was a little under $56,000, and they received an incentive from Eversource. And then um, a few years later, they applied for a competitive grant for um, a VRF system in their library. And um, the system uh, at overall cost about $26,000, and our grant provided a good amount of support towards that. They also uh, received a, a incentive payment from the Mass Clean Energy uh, Center, and the town also contributed funding towards that project. Next slide. And uh, this shows the results of the graph. The, the chart is from the Riverside School. This is taken from the Mass Energy Insight account. And you can see um, the drastic reductions in MMBTUs um, from replacing the steam oil heat with the, uh, the mini splits. Um, the project did include some weatherization measures. Um, that's something that, you know, we heard earlier today is very important to make sure that the building is not, not leaking. Um, and it is a 1922 building, so um, there was, you know, ample opportunities for attic insulation and whatnot. Um, so you, you can see uh, the results with that in terms of energy usage and emissions. For the Slate Library, since that project was just completed, we haven't had a full heating cycle with that, but um, it's estimated to save about 700 gallons of oil annually and about $1,300 in savings. And um, the building uh, occupants do report improved comfort in the, in the library. Next slide, please. Um, little details about the Green Communities Grants. Um, for the competitive grants, we have a number of communities that have been very active in our program for 10 years, and they are now part of the 750 Club. So when I spoke earlier about uh, the com competitive grants being capped at $200,000, for this elite group, their uh, grants are capped at $100,000. Um, other things to consider, particularly with the competitive grant, is to check the measure life of the project. Um, we, we would love to fully support all uh, heat pump projects, but um, given limited funds and whatnot, we certainly can't uh, support something with a 100-year payback. So we expect um, communities to um, have some sort of cost share with some of these projects. Um, as I mentioned earlier, weatherization is very important, and um, for these projects, as well as all HVAC um, equipment upgrades, we're going to require that the building is uh, weatherized. And uh, one thing I didn't include on this bullet point, um, for green community grants, we will not fund heat pumps that are for cooling only. Um, if you're going to install a heat pump, it should be for heating and cooling. Next slide. So we have uh, 271 green communities, um, a little more than what our friend from MassSave mentioned. Um, as I also said, we're still working with, you know, 10 to 20 additional communities. But as you can see, we're um, 
from Pittsfield to P-Town and where, you know, a large swath of the state is a part of the green community. Next slide. Here's our, our contact information. Um, we have regional coordinators um, who normally squat in DP office buildings, but now they're uh, virtually in the regions. And these are um, point of contact for municipalities. So if you're in Western Mass, you want to talk to Mark Rabinsky. If you're in Northeastern Mass, you want to talk to Neil Duffy. If you're in the central part of the state, you want to talk to Kelly Brown. And if you're in the southeast part of the state, Cape and the Islands, you want to talk to Lisa Sullivan. And with that, I think um, the next slide is the end of my contact information. And I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the Q&A. For green communities, does a Mass Save Muni application need to be submitted by March to get the audit done in time for a competitive grant application the following year? Um, not necessarily. I think they're sort of um, mixing um, the audit, the Mass Save application with um, the green communities audits. So um, our, our competitive grant deadline has traditionally been in March. This year we expend, extended it to May given the COVID situation. Um, and uh, we um, expect communities to include incentive amounts in their grant application because we you know, want to leverage all additional, all funding available for the projects. Um, so um, the audit should be done before March because the deadline's in March. Um, but in terms of uh, for the following year, I mean, the audit can be done any time, I guess, but um, we want to have the incentive information um, with the grant application. Okay. Um, now, there are a couple other questions. Oh, um, is, is it still true that designation grants can be used for solar PD, but competitive grants can't? Uh, right now, uh, you're correct, uh, competitive grants, uh, solar PV is not an allowable project. Um, for designation grants, we allow it only if all other efficiency projects identified or the majority of efficiency projects identified in the community's energy reduction plan have been uh, installed or uh, done. Now we will hear from Sean Newell, who is the um, Assistant Director of Facilities for the Town of Lexington. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will try to get through this as fast as possible, but as, um, as, as, as fast enough, but though, so you can hear me. Uh, so my name is Sean Newell. Um, I'm the Assistant Director of Public Facilities for the Town of Lexington. Uh, Laura, can you go to the next slide? That's my introduction. Sorry about that. Um, I oversee the operations and energy management for about 1.5 million square feet of buildings of both town and schools. Um, I've been in building operations and education uh, for about 28 years. I got a bachelor's degree in electromechanical technology from Wentworth Institute. Um, I've been in the town of Lexington since 2006, uh, at which point in entering the town, we had two geothermal uh, elementary schools. Uh, that's kind of why they brought me on to get those schools kind of uh, in hand. Uh, and since then, we've moved forward with geothermal and VRF systems. Uh, you know, the next slide. So I'd like to go through an agenda and hopefully explain a little bit about the uh, VRF system overview, which I'll, I'll go through pretty fast because Mitsubishi and Daikin really covered that. Uh, why VRF and VRV systems? Why Lexington went this way? A little bit about the pros and cons of these systems. Kind of some lessons learned for the town. And then obviously Lexington is moving towards a, a net zero, net positive future. Um, we've really moved towards all electric buildings uh, within the last year or two. Most of our buildings are all electric. Uh, it's only on emergency electrical generation do we use natural gas um, because the buildings kind of follow with our uh, uh, coop plan. Next slide. So uh, Mitsu and Jacob went over this. It's basically a VRF system overview of uh, air exchanges and, and basically energy um, 
you know, as you cool a room, you can move that heat that's being rejected into another room uh, in, your, in the space or in the zone, um, saving utilities and electricity uh, from an efficiency standpoint. You know, the next slide. Um, this is kind of an older generation heat pump system where it was not simultaneous cool and heat. It would either heat the space or cool the space. Uh, we've moved towards uh, simultaneous heat cool here in the town so that within a zone you could heat a space and cool a space um, during the summer or the winter. Uh, the next slide, this would be a representative of the new simultaneous heat cool systems. I think uh, Daikin covered this on their units. This is what's a uh, Mitsubishi system. This is a BC controller, which is basically a box that will allow you to transfer heat from one space to the other uh, instead of rejecting it out of the building. Um, those are the systems that we're moving towards. So some of the cons with DRF systems is uh, as we look at buildings to a baseline, we look at life cycle, uh, the life cycle on a DRF system in the past has been low. Uh, I think ASHRAE has got them listed as a 15 to 20 year life cycle, uh, where some of the older systems are in the 30s, uh, 30 year life cycle. But I would leave that to your engineering and your architectural team to kind of judge whether that's the way that you want to go. Um, if you look at VRF systems, they have sophisticated controls. Uh, so if you don't have in house uh, technicians, diagnosticians in your group, um, you're going to have to get on-call contracts to basically maintain and watch over these systems. Lexington is lucky enough to have three HVAC um, technicians on board as well as uh, plumbers and electricians. Um, like some of the other towns, we are a co-joined department. Like I said, we handle both town schools, so we have a lot of in-house personnel to take care of these things. Uh, you know, we were looking at these systems as a con as lower lead points because of the refrigeration systems throughout the building as, a, as opposed to distributed water, you have distributed uh, refrigeration. So if you're worried about lead points, uh, you could probably make up for that in some of the aspect of lead if you're heading that way. Um, I think Dakin and Mitsubishi really covered this um, on refrigerant leaks. That's really not a manufacturing issue. That is an installation issue usually. Um, and I'll get into, uh, I've written some notes that, uh, you know, realtors always talk about uh, location, location, location. In the facilities business, I would say specifications, specifications, specifications. Um, if you are not asking for the right things in your specifications, like certified personnel that are working on these systems in whatever systems you purchase, that needs to be in your specifications. Um, they also talked about pressure testing and vacuum testing. That those those types of systems need to be witnessed by your commissioning agent as to being evacuated, pressurized, and watched over. Um, you'll have nothing but problems and thumbs down on VRF systems. Um, and it's not really a manufacturer issue. It's the installation of these systems that if you don't have the watchdog watching them and you're getting reports back on these systems, uh, you're gonna down the road uh, after the contractor is long gone, um, you're going to be chasing these and hopefully that you have the right technical on-call contracts to chase these down. Uh, by getting the reports um, up front, you'll be able to extend your warranties on these systems. So be very careful on uh, specifications. Uh, I'm sure some other stuff will come up as, as I'm talking on that. Uh, need for technical personnel on staff. Uh, if you don't have them, make sure that you have uh, the right on-call contract to handle these systems, or at least send, if you do have the technical personnel, to send them out for the training. Uh, both Mitsubishi and Daikin have training. I, I would highly recommend that you send personnel for this training. Uh, the two companies that have been here, they've really been in the Northeast region for a while, so you've really had a good overview of at least two companies that I would trust putting these uh, system in, systems in place or helping you get them in place. Um, with, uh, like I said, with the specifications. Um, and when it comes down to your own people, service tools and training, and what I mean by service tools is your in-house personnel have to have laptop computers with the right service tool from the manufacturer so that they can look at these systems and see how they're running and getting your people certified and training on how to work on them. 
being able to buy parts and, and basically do diagnostics. Um, nothing worse than a uh, what I call a mechanic because they just keep throwing more parts at at uh, systems and they really don't know what they're doing that you really need to have good technically trained personnel in your staff. Uh, turnaround time on parts. Um, you have to ask yourself, are your vendors in the area? Uh, Mitsubishi is in Massachusetts. Daikin is in Massachusetts. There are some other manufacturers that are out there and um, that they're trained personnel. You might find out that they're in Florida when they're not even up in this northeast region and you're you're in the dead of winter and your system's down and the people that you're trying to chase after are not even in this area. So please watch out for that as you're as you're putting systems in your uh, in your buildings. Uh, next slide. So pros, VRF systems, if you get a net zero gold, if you're trying to do um, all site based energy with electric buildings, um, VRS uh, definitely one of the aspects of the ways to go with your buildings. Um, space savings, ease of installation, I'll show you a slide on that. Uh, lower installation costs, totally agree with that. Um, also with installation costs, also look at your operating costs uh, as opposed to other systems. Um, so that's really something that an energy engineer you should have on board is doing this for you. Uh, or having them vet your engineer. So when your engineer tells you this is what it is, I would still have a third party vetting what your engineer is telling you. Uh, sound le levels. Um, some of the ducted, uh, when I say ducted systems for VRF, the system is in the space and you don't have duct work running throughout the building, but you might have duct work running above the sailing plenum. Uh, that sound levels on these systems are pretty low and it's good for if you're dealing with 504 plans or IEP plans in schools. Um, pros, simultaneous heating, cooling, uh, that's heat transfer. Uh, those are definitely good systems to be looking at. Uh, if you're trying to get away from gas in your building, you're not worried about combustion, flues, intakes, gas piping, your carbon footprint, no gas odors, misfires, things like that. Um, these VRF systems are definitely a thumbs up in that end. Metering and trending, their controllers will actually do that for you. So as you listen to, um, you know, the AECs, the aches that you can get on these systems and trying to verify what you're doing, um, it's good to have a system that's going to do that for you. Uh, so that you can prove that you're saving money with these systems. Um, most of the systems that we have, we are cur currently proprietary uh, Mitsubishi in Lexington. I, I don't have an issue with uh, Dakin. It's just that all of my personnel are trained on Mitsubishi. Um, so it integrates into the current infrastructure of the whole town and looking at energy and how buildings are running. Um, I found that both of them integrate well. Uh, I like uh, Mitsubishi because uh, we can kind of manipulate their set points uh, from a central location. I'm sure that Dakin does the same thing, but um, again, they're not currently in our town. We look at them for energy efficiencies, obviously all electric, no, no natural gas, no fossil fuels, no emissions on site. Uh, grant and incentives currently right now are great on some of these systems. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, space saving. So I think that they went over this. You could see large duct work trying to run through historical buildings with this type of duct work is really not the way you want to go. Uh, whether you're looking at um, Daikin or Mitsu. So Daikin's a three pipe system, Mitsu two pipe system, um, refrigerant lines running through historical um, chases, uh, less intrusive in the existing architecture you'll find in most of your buildings. Next slide. Um, just wanted to show you these pictures of these condensing units. These are one of the things that they had talked about yesterday is with the accessories. So if you look, I don't know if you can see my arrow, you see the pipe work, you can see these stands, you can see these weather heads. Um, these are the type of systems that you need to have in place. Don't value engineer them out uh, during the project. Uh, if you need to hide them, great place to hide them. Um, this system right here, I would say that's probably actually improperly installed. You can see the snow building up. This should be on a stand. It's probably on the, the peak of the roof where snow can come down and, and break these fans. So um, probably wouldn't install that like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, weight savings. So if you're dealing with uh, old structures, uh, you know, the normal type of equipment that we're looking at, if you look at the weight and the structure of buildings and where you could put chillers as opposed to condensing units, you can see that 
is a large savings in weight and size on some of these uh, these systems. Uh, next slide. Mechanical spaces, if you don't have the mechanical space within the building, uh, you know, traditional systems require space for pumps, boilers, chillers, ductwork, piping, heat exchanges, and the VRF systems offer uh, efficiency in space requirements um, if you're going to go this way. Next slide. So selecting a manufacturer, um, proprietary or not, it's really the what is the um, political culture of your town that you're dealing with. Do they like to keep open uh, to have any different type of system put in the building that they think they're going to get a better pricing on it? Um, I would say not. I would say try to pick a manufacturer and stick with them as, as best you can uh, and make things uniform. It's going to make it easier for your facilities directors and assistant directors, as well as your technical people in the training and the tools that have to be kept on site. So, um, so just look at those bullet points. I would say that those are kind of what I would hit um, as you're going through your town and trying to get these systems installed. Next slide. The do's and don'ts follow the manufacturer's guidelines for cold weather installations. That's a must, must, must. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't get that to be bigger so you could actually read it, but obviously Mitsubishi, if you ask them, they'll send it to you. Daikin, they'll send it to you. Um, if you pick a good engineering service, they should know this stuff. Um, next slide. Thank you. Um, here's a new visitor center install. This is right in the middle of our historic district. So that's right in downtown Lexington. Uh, as you can see, we've, we've got, um, trees built up and around it where it really is not intrusive in the historical district. It's obviously up to your historical district commissions to say they like it or they don't like it, but you can see that this unit is off the ground. The pipe work actually goes underground, so we're not worried about it getting harmed during the winter time or the summertime. You'll see the weather heads on top. Uh, those are really good if you have to install it under um, uh, below a, a roof line where snow loads and ice uh, might drop on and, and hit these units. This is in the wide open, so um, really not too worried about it. And this, this spot, next slide. And this is what happens if you do install it, even with a weather head under the peak of a roof, ice can come down, damage your condenser fan units, and basically your system is going to go down in the dead of winter. So be worried about placement of your condensing units, uh, obviously, because we're in the Northeast and we don't want to have buildings down in the dead of winter. Next slide. I just did another slide of the fan. So again, this system had the wrong stands, the wrong refrigeration pipe piping was out in the open, ice damage. We had nothing but issues with this condensing unit because of the placement and because it wasn't specified clearly where it should have went and how it should have been installed. Next slide. So VRF and existing buildings, um, again, you've heard this less intrusive to existing historical architecture, smaller refrigerant piping instead of large ductwork, uh, outdoor installation flexibility, doesn't have to be really that close to the building, it could be away from the building. Uh, some examples of buildings that we've uh, put VRF systems in, Carrie Memorial Building, very uh, large uh, historical building that we use for um, basically having concerts. East Lexington Fire Station, small branch fire station. It was easy for conversion. It was a steam system. Uh, we went to uh, all electric heat pumps and that. Uh, so quick conversion. Same with the public school central administration building. Uh, this is the best way to get heat and cooling into a, an office space. Uh, Lexington Community Center was a, a, a building that we had purchased and we did a mechanical renovation uh, and went with an all VR system uh, also with an energy recovery uh, units. And then all of our prefabricated module buildings and various schools, we use VRF systems. Uh, and the modular buildings that we build, we don't build them for five years anymore. We build them for 25 to 30 years. Uh, so, uh, you know, low capital investment cost to get schools into the expansion they need because of enrollments. Uh, next slide. So this was a renovation retrofit in a historical building. This is the Cam Memorial Building. Um, 
you can see the historical architecture, right? We're trying to keep this facade like it is. Go to the next slide. And what we're trying to do is really hide um, within a historical district where those condensing units go. Uh, this is on the back end of the building. Um, so really not that intrusive within the historic district. Next slide. You can see this is a historical room. The only thing you can see in there is that cassette unit in the ceiling. It kind of blends very well with the interior application. Um, so you have a historic building, but you're trying to use it with all of the newer technology to make them the type of meeting spaces that you need to get them to be. Next slide. Same with this. In this room, you won't see any cassette units or all ceiling units. This is actually a ducted system, so there were some crawl spaces that we were able to duct uh, a unit into this space and not have any appearance with the architecture whatsoever. Um, but now this, this room is now heated and cooled by a VRF system. Next slide. New construction. This is the business center. I've already showed you the convention unit and how that looks outside. It's over to the left-hand side. This was kind of pre before we put in some of the bushes and trees. So you can see it's out in the open, but um, you can't see it actually right now. That's due to open within the next, well, it won't open, but it'll be open within the next two to three weeks. Uh, next slide. So again, you can see the cassette units up in the ceiling left and right, but from an architecturally pleasing, this is what you'll walk into if you walk into the visitor center. Um, so this is their main foyer. Next slide. This is a meeting space uh, with a diorama where people can go in and read about uh, Lexington. Uh, you can see that cassette unit blends in very well. Next slide. I've already talked about that. Just wanted to show you what it looked like. Next slide. This is the, the brand new main fire station headquarters. This is an all VRF system um, for both the, uh, the living quarters and the meeting spaces, um, the heat pump actually generates water out to the, uh, the apparatus bay. So we're doing radiant heat, but using the VRF system to do radiant heat in the floor of that. Uh, on the right-hand side, those are actually three bays for the fire trucks to basically back up into. Uh, we should be finished with that within the next three weeks. Next slide. This is one of our prefabricated module buildings. You'll see on the top end of that roof, you'll see all of the condensing units that are standing off the roof. But this is uh, an expansion to the high school due to enrollment. Uh, this was an added, I believe it was a, added eight classrooms to this high school um, as it's ever growing uh, currently. Um, one of the, you'd have to go back to the slide, but one of the issues on that system was it wasn't specified correctly, and we ended up getting a manufacturer that was based out of Florida. So when the system went down, getting parts to bring it back up and running uh, and getting their technical service in was like pulling hair or pulling teeth, however you want to say it. So again, I go back to find out who your local people are and try to get the systems that you're going to get the fastest response to get these systems back up and running. Next slide. So VRF perks, I think you've heard this, um, the Mass CEC grants or the AEC, um, you know, we're, we're going to end up with uh, these type of AECs. Uh, we're going to end up with multipliers. Um, it would have been great to actually have touch base with both uh, the DOER on this as we could have been a, a case study uh, so you guys could see how one of these buildings kind of plays out financially. Uh, when they're being built. So basically from the inception of the capital costs, the return on investment, and then all these grants. So we've worked with everybody that's been on this call, the town of Lexington has worked with. I'll let you know it's been an easy process working with all of these people. So hopefully uh, if you're on this call, you're most likely already doing it. Uh, it's the people that aren't on this call uh, that hopefully we can reach out to at some point in time and pull them into these calls. Um, I think that's it. Next slide. That's it. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast. I just want to get us through it so that more Q and A's could happen. So Sean asked, have you installed a DOA unit? Uh, yeah, so we use uh, some people DOA or ERVs or ERUs. To me, they're pretty close to being all the same, but yes, we've installed them. 
Uh, one of the big things for the town of Lexington is basically the health and the resiliency of the buildings. Um, we're trying to bring in 100% outside air. We also uh, engineer and uh, design buildings to be 30% uh, greater than code. Uh, so uh, if you're in that kind of mode, you have to head that way. You have to put in uh, the DOAS systems, uh, ERV systems. Uh, I'll let you know one thing that we have done uh, is we make sure that those systems also provide backup heat. So uh, it's not a, a thing of distrusting the VRF system, but it's always good to have uh, backup heat within your DOAS or your EIV system. So uh, I would design them that way. Uh, it gives you a little breathing room uh, if for some reason you're having any system issues. Thanks. And then we got a question, how has having a VRF system impacted your O&M costs? So that's a good question. So it really depends on the type of town you are, right? It's, a, it's about the personnel. It's about having the right people, doing the right things, doing it repeatedly. Um, right now, uh, like I said, I have three HVAC electricians in-house. Um, their rate is about $35 an hour as opposed to an on-call contract, which you would probably have to pay somewhere in the $80 to $85 range. Uh, so it's, it's all about who do you have in-house as opposed to outside contracts. Um, I have not seen it as a large O&M issue at this point. So as far as breakdowns, I go back to that pressure testing, vacuum testing, and getting, uh, I don't know what uh, Dyke and what might call their report, Mr. Bishop calls it a diamond report. Make sure that you get that diamond report. It's, uh, that means that Mitsubishi has witnessed it. They will extend the warranties on your compressors and in some case on the labor. Um, I would say that that's critical. And then it's really having the right people known to do the right things and training people. It, it'll lower your costs. So it's kind of a tricky question on how does it lower your O&M? That's how Lexington does it. We have in-house personnel. I hope that if that doesn't answer the question, you can ask another one. Thanks, Sean. Those are, oh, here's one more. Uh, can you give an example of how much you got in eight dollars and how much did the metering cost? Um, I think that last slide. So let me just give you some just remember that these buildings are just coming online now, but the Mass EC, I think it was the AICS, was $80,000 for a 29,000 square foot um, preschool that we built. Um, and then we are now putting solar under the SMART program on that site because the building was finished last September. We should have the solar in site uh, the solar done on site probably by the end of October and up and running, that will actually be a net positive building. We'll actually be generating twice as much solar energy as the building uses, uh, as opposed to 110,000 square foot elementary geothermal school in which we will be have the site energy that would be just equal to the energy use of the building for net zero. Um, I don't have that number for the Hastings, but we also have an AEC, uh, a Mass EC AEC uh, certificate on that. And I hate to spit out numbers without having the forms in front of me, but that was somewhere up in the $120,000 range, I think it was. Uh, and then once we do the proof of the metering, uh, there'll be a multiplier to that. Um, most of the metering that we put in is either through specification. So um, if somebody wanted to reach out to me when you give uh, my contact information out, um, I should be able to supply them with any information, utility bills, anything like that that they want to see. Also, I'd open up that um, if people wanted to come out onesies, twosies, they could contact me. Um, as long as we follow social distancing rules, I could still get you into buildings to take a look around if that's what you really, if you need to feel it and touch it. And ha I have no problem with people contacting me. Great, thank you. Um, Greg and JS, if you're on, there's one question 
that I think would be best for you to answer, if you could take a look at that. Yes, the question, uh, the question is, can heat pumps be used in highway or fire department garages that otherwise would utilize propane, oil, or wood fire, or wood, heat, wood for heating? These buildings tend to be difficult to heat due to the large heat loss when opening the doors. Are there any examples of communities that have retrofit existing garages with heat pumps? Uh, I can't think of an example. Uh, it it can it can be done. It's uh, there's definitely challenges. Uh, VRF systems are very efficient, but they they're not as fast reacting. Uh, there are air curtain types of units you can put in that could go over the garage doors that are actually VRF driven. So that's an option. Uh, that, can I that speak? Can I speak to that briefly? So at the main fire station in Lexington, they actually used a high R value fast acting door and used radiant heat. So you've got this massive thermal sink there that when the doors open, the engine leaves and the doors close fast, but you've got the thermal mass basically heated. So it helps with the, I think what you're going to get into was the, the makeup of the, the heat in that space. So it really goes back to engineering design on, at least for us, on our main fire station. Yeah, that makes sense. Greg, did you want to add something on your end? Yeah. Um, so for instance, I agree with you, JF, that, I mean, yeah, typically it's the, all that heat leaving the garage when a door is opened and then uh, something like a heat pump will typically spend a lot of time trying to make that up. And they aren't really meant to have um, such low inter and air temperatures, but the way Sean just described is great. That's a really kind of great way to do it as far as use the doors, the quick acting doors, not use that heat, as much heat, but then uh, that system has what we call hex units. So the refrigerant to water units that can be make up to 160 degree water, and that can be used as a radiant, radiant mass, which makes that situation a lot better. I've also seen that used to send hot water to uh, different cabinet heaters just to do something. Um, but you have to, a lot of what we talked about in the presentation is you have to look at the, the whole picture, the whole scenario. We're not just going to have a system that dumps a bunch of heat. You're going to want to combine it with minimizing the heat loss uh, along yeah. with um, what you add to take care of that. Yeah. That was our last question. Uh, our Contact info for everybody who spoke is up here. Thanks again, Greg and JS. Thank you everyone again for attending. Thank you, Sean, for that presentation. Very, very insightful. Yeah, thank you everyone for putting this together and attending. Um, glad all our contact info is up there. Please reach out if you have any questions or I know we flew through a lot of things quick, so always happy to expand on Okay, thanks. Take care, everybody.